Yeah, you, it, it's like uh, three guys have each got a window and we're staring at the at the ground. It's really, uh, boy, this has got to be the neatest way to make a living anybody's ever invented. This is Apollo Control Houston at uh, 63 hours, 52 minutes into the mission. We now show Apollo 16 at a distance of 24,470 nau uh, nautical miles uh, from the moon and uh, traveling at a velocity of uh, 3,567 feet per second. Our uh, Capcom, uh, Hank Hartsfield, has uh, not spoken with the crew uh, on his shift yet uh, this morning. However, he will place the wake-up call, and the wake-up call is now scheduled uh, for a bit over three hours uh, from this time. We're at uh, 63 hours, 53 minutes, and this is Apollo Control Houston. This is Apollo Control Houston at uh, 64 hours, 51 minutes into the mission. We now show the Apollo 16 spacecraft uh, 24,237 nautical miles away from the moon. We've had no contact uh, with the crew of Apollo, Apollo 16 for the past hour, nor do we expect contact with the crew uh, for a bit more than two hours. Uh, crew wake-up time is now two hours and eight minutes away. Uh, we'll stand by, however, and continue to monitor uh, conversations uh, within the Mission Control Center and uh, the various displays. At uh, 64 hours, 52 minutes ground elapsed time, this is Apollo Control Houston. This is Apollo Control Houston at uh, 65 hours, 51 minutes into the mission. We now show Apollo 16 at a distance of uh, 20,195 nautical miles away from the moon and uh, traveling now at a velocity of uh, 3,626 feet per second. The crew of Apollo 16 uh, uh, can expect their wake-up call and a bit over an hour. Our countdown clock in mission control shows uh, one hour, eight minutes uh, remaining until time of wake-up. The uh, flight plan uh, for uh, the upcoming day for the crew is essentially uh, unchanged. However, what I, one item is still open, uh, this being the decision on whether or not to do mid-course correction for we're at uh, 65 hours, 52 minutes uh, ground elapsed time, and uh, this is Apollo Control Houston. Apollo Control Houston at uh, 66 hours, uh, 16 minutes into the mission. We now show Apollo 16 at uh, 19,304 nautical miles away from the moon, and now traveling at a speed of uh, 3,643 feet per second. Although uh, we've had no conversations with them. Uh, our data here in Mission Control uh, indicates uh, the crew uh, is awake, uh, uh, waking up on their own. Uh, we will stand by with the air ground line up uh, to pick up any conversation uh, between uh, the crew of Apollo 16 and uh, Capcom uh, Hank Hartsfield uh, should it occur. We're at uh, 66 hours, 17 minutes, uh, ground elapsed time, uh, continuing to monitor. This is Apollo Control, Houston. Morning, Houston. Matty Reed, over. Good morning, 16. How are you this morning? Uh, pretty good there. Apollo Control, Houston, uh, 66 hours, 20 minutes uh, into the mission. Apollo 16, now 19,161 nautical miles away from the moon. Velocity now shows uh, 3,646 feet per second. We heard that uh, brief exchange between Apollo 16 uh, Commander John Young and uh, Hank Hartsfield, who is manning the uh, capsule communicators console here in Mission Control. The, uh, First activity scheduled in the uh, flight.
flight plan uh, for this morning for Apollo 16 is a a uh, breakfast or eat period. Uh, presumably, they uh, if they have not already started, they will be pressing on and. their uh, first uh, bite of the morning very shortly. We're at uh, 66 hours, 21 minutes. Uh, this is Apollo Control, Houston. Okay, uh, Houston, the uh, lamp CM T is uh, about one. And the cap pressure being what it is, I guess that means that uh, we really don't have any leakage up there much. Roger, copy. One PSI. Yes, I do, Hank. Stand corrected. Apollo Control Houston at uh, 66 hours, uh, 29 minutes. Apollo 16 is now uh, 18,839 uh, nautical miles uh, away from the moon and now traveling at a speed of uh, 3,652 feet per second. This is Apollo Control Houston uh, continuing to monitor. Apollo Control Houston at uh, 66 hours of uh, 47 minutes uh, into the mission. We now show Apollo 16 at a distance of uh, 18,243 nautical miles. Uh, this is a distance away from the moon. We uh, now read uh, Apollo 16's velocity at uh, 3,664 feet per second. At uh, 66 hours, 46 minutes, continuing to monitor, this is Apollo Control, Houston. It's Apollo Control, Houston, uh, 67 hours uh, ground elapsed time. Our displays now show Apollo 16 at uh, a distance of 17,704 nautical miles uh, from the moon. And we show a speed uh, of 3,676 feet per second. Uh, we've had no further uh, communication with the crew of Apollo 16 since uh, that original greeting uh, from uh, spacecraft commander John Young. But uh, we will continue to monitor, uh, and this is Apollo Control Houston. This is Apollo Control Houston at uh, 67 hours, uh, 10 minutes uh, ground elapsed time. We show the uh, spacecraft Apollo 16 presently at, at a distance of 17,350 nautical miles away from the Earth, or away from the moon, and uh, traveling at a speed of 3,684 uh, feet per second. Uh, meanwhile, in the Mission Control Center, uh, Flight Director uh, Phil Schaffer has uh, just decided that uh, a mid-course correction number four burn will not be required. We're at uh, 67 hours, 11 minutes, continuing to monitor. Uh, this is Apollo Control, Houston. Roger. All right, Henry, we'll start here on uh, 
A section. A one two two zero four one. Alpha three. Six and a half. Outstanding. Alpha four. None. Alpha five. Two seven. And two five. Alpha six. Seven. Ten. And five. Bravo one. Charlie 6, just two entries, 5 and 7. That's firm. Okay, make that 5, 5 and 7. And off the gourmet seat. Uh, well, stand by, Ken. We're coming up on antenna switch, and we'll lose on, Tom uh, for a few minutes. Apollo Control Houston at uh, 67 hours, uh, 18 minutes into the mission. Uh, what you just heard was uh, Ken Mattingly uh, passing along the crew's biomedical report uh, following a convenience format uh, using letters and numbers uh, uh, for speed in reporting. Uh, for example, A is a commander, uh, B is the uh, command module pilot, and C is a lunar module pilot. The uh, six uh, data pieces of data reported on were uh, radiation uh, dosometer readings, uh, food, this is a negative report uh, when the crew member followed the plan menu, amount of sleep, medication, urine, and uh, water consumed. At uh, 67 hours, 19 minutes, uh, we show Apollo 16 at uh, 17,033 nautical miles away from the moon and traveling at a speed of 3,691 feet per second. Sixteen, Houston. Apollo sixteen, Houston. Apollo sixteen, Houston. Okay, go ahead. Okay, uh, we're so far you're so far out now that when we get close to antenna switching, we lose calm there for about a minute, a minute and a half. We're ready to copy the uh, the menu now. Food. Okay, our menu reporter is uh, sealing a cup of coffee. He'll be waiting in a second. Roger, and the surgeon compliments the reporter on the way he reads the report down. Yeah, when you got a college education, you learn to read. Boy, anything can happen after that. Okay, Henry. The happy gourmet says that for the commander. We'll start with uh, meal A, and a uh, standby one. Okay, on the commander, you can delete the grits. On meal B, uh, we we skipped the Skylab meal for meal B and then ate it as meal C. And on that. Uh, And for the second meal on uh, the day, John had a grapefruit drink, bread with peanut butter, and, and 
I guess that's it. Okay. Okay, on mine, you can start on meal A, scratch some peaches, uh, scrambled eggs, four bacon squares, and grits. On meal B, I had uh, the bread and peanut butter and a grapefruit drink. On the Skylab meal, I have one of the two rye breads, and on all this chicken spread, no one ate a third of it. That's we probably eat a tenth of a, a piece. And for Charlie, he's been good. He, he eats everything. Uh, none of us ate the peanuts on the Skylab meal. And for the second meal of the day, Charlie had uh, an orange pineapple drink with potassium and peanut butter. And you'll be happy to know that we shared our peaches with Casper. He ate uh, just about as much of them as we did. Roger, copy. That sounds kind of like it didn't work out too well. There's a lot of peach still on Casper's face, I'll tell you that. Uh, Night, when you open that can, you get them all at once. Charlie, you're going to have to work on those guys about the grits. Grits are good. I can't get them to eat them, though. They, I share uh, eight part of John's. Okay, Hank, and uh, maybe I missed it here somewhere, but could you give us some words on what you plan to do about uh, mid-course four? Okay, uh, no mid-course four. And... Uh, I got a couple items of news here if you're interested in that. Okay, is that general interest news or like uh, how we handle our relay setting and so forth? Oh, it's just general interest stuff and uh, we're coming up on antenna switching. Okay, we'll catch you after that. Apollo Control Houston, uh, 67 hours, uh, 27 minutes into the mission. Uh, as you heard, the uh, crew of Apollo 16 uh, sounds fresh and ready this morning. The uh, principal spokesman for the crew uh, thus far has been Ken Mattingly, who uh, uh, provided the status reports. Uh, we show Apollo 16 at uh, 16,736 nautical miles away from the moon. We now show the velocity of Apollo 16 at 3,699 feet per second. At uh, 67 hours at 28 minutes, continuing to monitor, uh, this is Apollo Control, Houston. 16, Houston. Houston, yep, yep. Okay, 16, how you read? Okay, Henry, uh, how about if we stop PTC right here at this 144-degree uh, pass? Henry, did you copy that? Roger, we copied, and uh, we got some flight plan updates for you, and you can uh, stop it now if you like. Okay, go ahead. Okay, repeat, no MCC-4 is required, and for your information, the data there for the UV photos is good for an hour after the flight plan time, so there's no real rush on that one. Uh, if you're ready to copy, we'll just charge right into these flight plan changes. Uh, the first one is at 70 hours and 40 okay, go. 70 hours and 40 minutes. We want to write in there charge bat A, and that's for your information for about three hours and 20 minutes. Okay, at 70:40 we'll charge battery A, and that's roughly going to be three and a half hours. That's affirmative. And at 7120, we want to enter load DAP, 
with the weights and gimbal trim from Miss Finn. And call EMP 509. Okay, at uh, 7120, we'll load the DAP with Miss Finn weights and gimbals and call EMP 509. That's affirmative. The next thing occurs at 7355 at the sextant star check. I want to add in parentheses, no verb 41. Manually, manual only with verb 16, now 91. Okay, I've got uh, at the 7355 at the sextant star check. We'll do no verb 41. And we'll do it manual with uh, 1691 as our check. That is affirmative. And uh, ECOM advises you can... Uh, well, we're on that, Henry. Uh, yeah, while we're on that one, Henry, uh, I didn't see where we terminated 509. Do we keep it running all this time? That is affirmative. Thank you. Okay, and ECOM advises you can go ahead and start that battery charge now if you want to get Charlie started on that. And uh, the next thing occurs at 74.08. And there we do the do SPS cue card through gimbal drive. Okay, that's at 74.08. It's SPS cue card through Gimbal drive. Roger and uh, LOS, Miss Finn LOS time will be 7418. Okay, 7418 is LOS. Okay, that's the uh, flight plan changes. I have some notes now. I don't know where's the best place to copy these. I've got about uh, nine or ten of them here. Well, I'll take it back. I got two notes on the use of EMP 509. And uh, they read as follows. Okay, let me get my scratch pad out and I'll copy those first. Okay, Henry, I'm ready to copy your notes. Okay, number one. The TVC DAP is unstable with EMP 509. Okay, understand the TVC DAP is unstable with 509 running. That is affirmative. And number two is at SPS cutoff plus 2.5 seconds, the TVC enable is de energized. The EMP is off. Thus, the platform alignment could be lost. Okay. Okay, and I have uh, some flight plan changes now that are concerned with DOI. The first one occurs at 70... Okay, stand by a second. All right. Okay, Henry, I'm ready. Uh, these are comments or these are uh, things to go into the flight plan? Roger, these are flight plan changes, Ken. I'm sorry I didn't get this in order a while ago. It was buried in the bottom here. Okay, go ahead. Okay, at 7757, there's a group of CSM systems checks. Uh, move those up to 7720. Okay, we take the CSM systems uh, checks and move them from 7758 over to 7720. That's affirmative. Now, at 7750, Verb 48, 21101, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1. Okay, at 7750, that's verb 48, the 21101, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1. That's affirmative. And immediately following that, start EMP 509. Okay, Henry, I guess I don't quite uh, understand the uh, loading to 
the Merv 48 to 21101. And then the next thing we do is to load a three in there. Uh, have someone give me some rationale on that. Uh, the difference there, Ken, is you, once when you're loading that Verb 48 for the, uh, the or the MP 509, you don't pro on that one and activate that DAP. Okay, I see what you're saying. All right. In other words, we have to get the right DAP in there before we do the MP 509. Uh, the next item is the activities that are located between 7803 and 7808. We want to move back to just following the P-52 at 7753. Okay, how about giving me the first line and the last line of the block you're talking about? Okay, that's uh, P-30, verify DOI TIG and Delta Vs, through acquire misspend Omni D. Move all of that back to just following the P-52 or landing site orient at 7753. And in that group of activities, we want to delete that verb 48. Okay, now what I have is, uh, have you got any more changes in this area? And then I'll read you what I have sequentially. Uh, there's nothing more on that particular page, uh, 77 through 78 hours. Okay, uh, maybe I missed something here, but I, I have not seen us uh, terminate 509. I'm sure we did somewhere before the, uh, before uh, the uh, LOI burn. And we'll do it we're going to get to do it, and that, Ken, we're going to have that on your cue card. I've got a cue card change coming up for you. Okay. All right, let me give you what I have here, and then... Uh, at 77.20, I do all of the CSM system checklist items that are listed now at 77.58. At 77.50, we do a verb 48, 21, 101, 01, 111. We start EMP 509er. Then at uh, about 77.55, we do all the steps which are presently listed at 78.03 down through 7808. And that's with the exception of the verb 48. That's right, with the exception of verb 48. Okay, that's all correct. Now, the next item is at 7822, we delete the sextant star check and move it back to 7815. And it carries the same warning as we had before. No verb 41, uh, manual only with uh, verb 16, now 91. Okay, at the section start check at 7815 with no verb 41, doing it manually, and deleting the start check at 7822. That's affirmative, and the last item for this is at 7818, add do SPS cue card through gimbal drive. Okay, that's at 7818, it's due SPS cue card through gimbal drive. Roger, and the cue card uh, that you'll use is the same for LOI and DOI. We're going to read you those changes. Okay. 16 Houston, I have your SPS burn card changes whenever you're ready to copy. Go ahead. Okay, uh, just as a note here for yourself, uh, you load the DAP before starting the card, and you do not change verb 48 after starting EMP 509. Now, we tried to indicate that in the flight plan, and I explained that to you a while ago. Okay, first step. Uh, at the top of the card, very first item, add EMP 509 called. Okay, at the very top of the card, it's EMP 509 is called. Roger, and then down the fifth item where it says load DAP, delete that. Okay, we'll delete load DAP. 
at where it says board side sex to start check. Delete the verb 41, now 91, enter, and make the comment no verb 41, manual only, with verb 16, now 91. Okay, we delete verb 41, now 91, and we say no verb 41, manual, verb 16, now 91. That's affirmative. At the left of the card, opposite main bus ties, where it says 54 minutes, change that to 40 minutes. And in parentheses, minus 20 minutes. Okay, we've changed 54 minutes to 40 minutes, and minus 6 to minus 20. Roger, and down a little further where it says 55 and 5, we want to change that to 41 and minus 19. Okay, we've changed 55 to 41 and minus 5 to minus 19. Okay, on the back side of the card. Uh, let me read you the whole thing we want to get in there, Ken, so you'll know how to squeeze it. Right after it says except parentheses pro, we want to get in there. If glitch occurs, use RHC to stop maneuver. Verb 23, noun 20, enter, enter. Verb 40, enter. Verb 62, enter. Manual maneuver to attitude. So you got to kind of squeeze that in there a little bit. I'll read it to you slowly now. If glitch occurs... Okay, stay in my second. Okay, go ahead, Hank. Okay, if glitch occurs... Use RHC to stop maneuver. Verb 23, noun 20, enter, enter. Verb 40, enter. Verb 62, enter. Manual. Maneuver to attitude. Apollo Control Houston, 67 hours, 50 minutes into the mission. Uh, we're listening to uh, Capcom Hank uh, Hartsfield uh, pass along flight plan updates to the crew of Apollo 16. This says that uh, this is after the pro on uh, Gimbal test, and we're saying that if, the, if you get one of these glitches, is use the RHC to stop the rates. Uh, would there be any objection to just switching to SCS while we do the rest of this? And uh, that's my question, then I'll read on. It's uh, verb 23, now 20, enter, enter. And I have a question there, and then I got the impression from what we were saying in our previous discussion that uh, this wasn't restricted just to the middle gimbal, it's a possibility for, for the others. And then a verb 40 enter, which will release the platform. Verb 62 will take us uh, uh, back. It's not. It's not clear to me. Uh, once we put in uh, now 20 is zero, that uh, verb 62 is a useful number. Seems to me that uh, I must have skipped something there. Okay, I. I'm a little puzzled about the verb 62 needles. Uh, however, on the other item, uh, the reason you only need a verb 23 is that the uh, that zeroes that CDU, which is the only one that locks you up in course of line, and uh, the others will reinitialize when we do the verb 40. Okay, I guess uh, my question though is that uh, if it can happen in each of them, the only time you do the verb 23, not 20 would be in the event that it did lock you into the uh, uh, course line. That's affirmative. Uh, Gato was just saying you cover all bets when you do this. You don't have to stop and think about it. Okay, but if you had moved off in, in yaw, it seems to me I would be possibly introducing more error. Apollo Control Houston, uh, 67 hours, 53 minutes into the mission. Apollo 16, now 15,800 nautical miles away from the moon, and now traveling at a speed of uh, 3,723 feet per second. Continuing to monitor, this is Apollo Control Houston.
Uh, Ken, would you would you state your concern again so we got a clear picture of it? Okay, uh, uh, maybe I'm off on a tangent. Uh, what it looked to me like is that um, if you pick up one of these uh, glitches, I'm not sure that the rates are all going to be confined to just uh, just one axis by the time it stops. And uh, if you then take and load uh, register three of now 20 to zeros, you may in fact uh, be at some other uh, middle gimbal angle than uh, zero. So uh, once you do that, I guess that, that has no effect if I do a verb 40. I guess that's a, I missed that point. Uh, that really gets me out of the uh, course line. That, that's affirmative. Is that correct? That's affirmative. The verb 40 starts the whole thing running okay. again. The verb 23, now 20, gets you out of the gimbal lock, if that's, be, if that's the case. Okay, now I'm with you. Now, I guess the only other thing is that in the event that we have the thing we have that happened the other night, and it did uh, course the line there, it seems to me that before I do the verb 40, I would want to fly back on SCS to zero middle gimbal angle. Is that correct? That's affirmative. Okay. Okay, I think I understand that. Thank you. Uh, the concern over the using the SCS can was they were afraid you'd introduce a, a transit, another transit in there by the switching. However, if uh, if you can't do can't null it out with the RHC, you might be forced into SCS. Oh, we'll sure give it a try. It's just like uh, perhaps once I just get the hand controller out of D10, then I'll stop it at whatever new attitude it has, and that that ought to hold it. So that there may be no further transients. I'll try that first. Roger. Are you ready to go on with the changes? Yes, sir. Okay, uh, out to the side there, well, a little error, I guess, is the best way to indicate it. In other words, between rate high and EMS normal, we want to say terminate EMP 509. Okay, when I terminate EMP 509, you want me to write that between rate high and EMS to normal? It looks like the, I would do the verb 48 back to my original values. But it looks like I would not be resetting the average G flag. Or do you want that reset anyhow? Stand by, Ken. Uh, Ken, the message is to do a normal terminate, as, a, as on the procedure they read up to you. And uh, that's after you finish the, the gimbal drive test. That's what it's associated with. And following that, the next item, just prior to 59 minutes, I don't know how you're going to get all this in there. You may have to write it to the bottom and show an error. At minus six minutes, tape recorder, high bit rate, record forward, command reset. You did not want to do that at uh, minus 20. Is that affirmative? That's affirmative. You want me to delete that from uh, minus 20? Yes, I omitted that, Ken. I was going back to that. Back over here at minus 20, we want to delete, scratch through, tape recorder, high bit rate forward, command reset. And uh, for your info, the reason we've given you this 20 minutes is uh, in both LOI and DOI, that gives us about 10 minutes to watch what you're doing, watch the gimbal drive check, and, uh, and if you need any help, we can give it to you from down here. Okay, that sounds like a good plan. Okay, you want the tape recorder on at uh, minus six minutes. That's affirmative. Okay, go ahead. Okay, following 00XX, ECO, enter uh, right in there, be prepared for SCS takeover. Okay, I got that. You ready for the next one, Ken? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Uh, right after TVC servo power one and two off, we want to enter a little comment uh, that says, prior to
to trimming noun 85s, noun 20s should be checked against the IMU. Okay, after TVC server power one and two off, and we'll put a note here that says prior to trimming noun 85, check noun 20 against IMU, and that's because of reaching the different angles off the FDAI pick off. That's affirmative. Okay. Okay, now I have changes for your SPS burn rules card. Stand by. Let me uh, read back what I got on here. Go ahead. On the SPS card, uh, I'm starting at the top with a boat. Can you read me all right now, Hank? Roger. Okay, uh, at the top of the card, I've added a note that says no verb 48 changes after entering 509. The first step on the card is EMP 509 is called. I have deleted load the DAP. Under the foresight section and star check, I have deleted verb 41 down 91. I have replaced that with a note that says no verb 41 and use manual, monitor 1691. I have changed the bus tie on time from 54 minutes to 40 minutes. And that changes minus 6 to minus 20. I have deleted the tape recorder line at minus 6 minutes. I've changed the time 55 to be 41, minus 5 to be minus 19. That's all the changes I have on the front side of the burn card. On the back side, next to the proceed after the Gimbal test option, if the if we get a glitch, it's RHC to stop rates. Verb 23 now 20 enter enter. Verb 40 enter. And then verb 62 enter. Manually maneuver to attitude. After rate high and before 59 minutes, terminate EMP 509. At minus six minutes, tape recorder goes to high bit rate, record forward, and command reset. At zero zero XX and engine cut off, it's be prepared for SCS takeover. At TVC, servo power one and two off. We've added the note prior to trimming noun 85, check noun 20 against the IMU. And that's all the comments I have on the birth card. That's a good read back, Ken. And uh, just to reiterate, that terminate EMP 509 is associated with terminating the gimbal test, or ending up on that. Roger. Any, I could do that any time after the gimbal test is completed. That's affirmative. Okay. We would prefer that termination right after the gimbal check. Yes, sir. I don't want to get caught too late doing that. Okay, Houston, uh, this uh, procedure, uh, it'll handle no matter what uh, glitch we get, and I understand that, but uh, how about some discussion of the probability of getting such a glitch? Is there any uh, anybody thinking about that much down there? I guess uh, all of us have been thinking about it, John, uh, but there's just no way we can predict whether it'll happen again or not. Our gut feeling on the thing is it'll probably never see it again. I understand uh, it's very similar to the kind of uh, thing that we had happen uh, back in the early part of the Apollo program with the CDUs that would make them count different. Is that not correct? That's affirmative. Okay, thank you. Uh, Houston, 16, ready to copy the SPS burn rules update. Okay, uh, the reason for these changes, Charlie, is after we 
watched MC6 and looked at the uh, system pressures there, we got some new data. And uh, for your information, we're kind of predicting that your nominal values are going to be oxidizer 200, fuel 170, and uh, for your onboard reading. So based on that, we need to change these uh, burn rules. And I believe you've already made one change to it. Is that correct? Yeah, but we got, uh, I can scratch it in again somewhere else. Okay. On the fuel oxidizer press, where you put in uh, 124 oxidizer, you want to change that to 138 oxidizer. And the fuel goes from 110 to 112. In other words, instead of 124 ox, 110 fuel, we want 138 ox, 112 fuel. Okay, copy, go ahead. Okay, for your fuel oxidizer delta P, the new rules are oxidizer greater than fuel by 50 to oxidizer greater than fuel by 12. Uh, wait a minute, I had uh, 50 uh, ox uh, less than fuel last time. Okay. But what what you had before, I think, was uh, 35 and 5. Is that correct? Oh, okay. You're right. 35 and 5. Okay. Go ahead again now. Okay. The the new ones become 50 oxidizer greater than fuel at, to 12 oxidizer greater than fuel. In other words, your 35 and 5 rules go to 50 and 12. Both of them, though, oxidizer greater than fuel. What we're changing is the 35 to 50, and we're changing the 5 to 12, and changing the sign over there, oxidizer greater instead of oxidizer less. Okay, uh, what you're telling me, that's the limit. Uh, uh, 50, uh, oxidizer greater than fuel can be as high as 50 or as low as 12. That's affirmative. Oxidizer greater than fuel in both cases. In other words, your range is oxidizer 12 to 50 psi greater than the fuel pressure. Okay, and on your tight limits, uh, okay. change the the oxidizer to 168 oxidizer. What, what you have there is 168 oxidizer, 153 fuel. You want to change that to 183 oxidizer, 153 fuel. No change in the fuel. Okay, uh, copy uh, tight limits. Oxidizer has to be greater than 183 and the fuel greater than 153. That's affirmative. Okay, uh, Hank, uh, let me give you an example here uh, on this uh, Delta P's. Uh, right now I'm looking at about 170 fuel and uh, 195 oxidizer. Uh, that says that I can go to uh, down to uh, uh, 150, uh, 140 on the fuel side with a constant oxidizer pressure before I reach my limit, or have the fuel pressure increase up to uh, 178 before I reach my limit. Is that correct? Uh, GNC's checking. Let me look at it, Charlie. Okay. This is Apollo Control. Shift handover underway in the control center here with Jerry Griffin's gold team taking over. There will not be a change of shift briefing this morning from the off-going shift. Repeat, there will not be a change of shift briefing. Oxidizer falls delta P of 12. That was the answer I got back on that. However, uh, on the example you gave, uh, I thought you were right with it. it Except on the the second part, it looked like to me you need a 12 difference there. Or I might have misread the thing. Okay, uh, I was just looking at my gauges here. I've got about 190 oxidizer pressure and about 165 uh, fuel pressure. And. Uh, so that says to me the fuel side could go up to 178 and I'd still be within uh, limits. That's what the rules say.
Okay. All right, the oxidizer could drop to 177. Hank, we have to get a uh, FPS press light uh, long as, uh, and still be within limits on these rules. Stand by. They're checking their cow cars now, Cam. They're going to come up with an answer on that. All right, thank you, sir. Okay, Houston, pressure equalization valve is coming open to equalize the pressure. I'm the Alpha 16. 16 GNC advises use the pressures and uh, and not the light in regard to the the burn. Rod, I'm just uh, wondering if I should expect to see it. Uh, that's affirmative. Uh, you may. It, we think the uh, uh, light would come on at 202 oxidizer pressure, and we're predicting you're going to be running around 200. Like to have the high gain antenna? That's affirmative. Flight plan angles, Ken. Huh? Okay, Houston, pressure equalization valve is closed. Uh, CM Delta D is two tenths now. Roger, copy, two tenths. Yeah, I think that two, that two tenths is what it reads whenever it's equalized. Roger, uh, that's true. And 16, uh, I also like to advise it on the tight limits. You're within 2 psi on the low pressure side for the fuel. Okay. And 16, I have your Perisentin plus 2 block data. Okay, why don't you stand by that and let us get these photos out of the way. Will do. Hey, uh, Hank, uh, Charlie just noticed that uh, we're in this uh, moon photo attitude, and uh, looks like the the sun is just uh, very, very close to to being along our line of sight. And it looks like we have uh, one of the changes we've gone in and opened some of these settings. Uh, can we get a verification to where we that this is the right uh, setup. We can't look out the window very well and tell you if we're more sighted on the moon. Uh, Roger, can this is a correct attitude. We'll take another quick scan of the settings. Uh, 16 Houston, would you attempt to bring up the high gain? Okay, you got uh, React and Nero. How does that look? Looks good, Charlie. And in regard to the photos, the PI says the sun will be very close to the moon, but uh, the, they shouldn't be in the field of view of the camera. The settings are good. Okay, we'll take them as is. Hey, Charlie, I got a message for you. Consolidated Jack Pines is way up. Thank you. So is Charlie. 16 Houston, I'm, we're going to do change over now, and uh, I'll see you later on this evening. Okay, Hank. Thank you, sir. Yeah, y'all go get some rest. It'll be a busy day later on. They're already on the way. Hello, Dan. Hello there. Wanted to advise you, you can relax now. You're in good hands with the gold team. Understand, the gold team is dot com. Houston 16, I'm ready for the block data update. Say again, 16, you're very weak. Well, that's because my mic's about 25 inches away. How's that? That's a lot better, Johnny. Okay, I'm ready for the uh, block updates. Roger. Okay.
Okay, Charlie, it's uh, PER plus two, SBS, GNN, six six three six three. Wait, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on a minute, P. Okay. Okay, I was on the P thirty seven. This is a P thirty pad. This is your abort pad. PER plus two abort. P-30 load. Okay, go ahead. Okay, it's P-E-R plus 2, S-P-S, G-N-N, 66363, plus 121, minus 014. Zero seven six two six one four four niner. Now eighty ones plus two one three three seven plus one one two three three minus two one seven eight one three three five one one six. Zero one eight. Rest of the pad is NA. College none. Under other number one, docked maneuver. Two, based on LOI refs mat. Three, gimbal angles on PTC refs mat are roll. Two six three pitch zero one seven yell three one zero Roger uh, Pete uh, thirty pad uh, Parasitian P E R plus two S B S uh, G N N six six three six three plus one two one minus zero one four zero seven six two six one four four nine -er. Plus two one three three seven plus one one two three three minus two one seven eight one three three five one one six zero eight one. Uh, correction zero one eight. Rest of the pad is in in A. All edges none. The docked maneuver based on the yellow eye rest mat. On a PTC rest mat, the gimbal angles are two six three zero one seven and three one zero. That's affirmative, Charlie, and uh, the yaw was uh, zero one eight. Okay. Well, you can go ahead. No sweat on the alarm. Roger. Just going to let it time out. Okay, you can go ahead and talk. We got the uh, torquing angles. Roger, we got them. You can go ahead and talk. Okay, I'll talk them at 3 9. That sure is a mighty super little platform, isn't it? Yeah, it's looking real sweet. Houston, 16. Go ahead, 16. Okay, uh, Pete, how about uh, giving us a little recap on uh, our mid-course two burn uh, as far as uh, what you all saw as chamber pressures and interface pressures and how does the old uh, SPS look versus the calibrations? All right, just stand by. We'll get it for you. Sixteen Houston, I've got the uh, figures on this uh, burn that you wanted, and uh, uh, I guess uh, I can start out by talking about the meter biases to make sure that we're clear on that. Uh, there's a 15 psi bias on the oxygen tank pressure. It's reading high. On top of that, there's a meter bias of 8 psi, which is also high, so that our total bias on the oxygen onboard pressure reading is about 23 psi high. Uh, oxidizer, I'm sorry. And on the fuel, it's 7 low total, which is a meter bias. Okay, we understand. Okay, then with those numbers in mind, the 
the chamber pressure during that burn was 100 psi, and the numbers that you should have read on board prior to the burn were oxidizer tank pressure 205 and fuel tank pressure 177. And after the burn, the numbers you should have been reading were 197 oxidizer and 170 fuel. In other words, they both dropped, uh, uh, well, fuel oxidizer dropped 8 and fuel dropped 7 psi during the burn. Uh, the interface pressures uh, pre-burn were oxidizer 184 and fuel 187. And uh, during the burn, they were at 168 oxidizer, 172 fuel. And after the burn, the interfaces were oxidizer 174 and fuel 179. And all of those look good to us. Oh, Roger, we got you. Okay, I don't know whether you noticed uh, your pressures during the burn. It was a pretty short burn, but the oxidizer tank should have read about 205 and the fuel tank about 175 during the burn. Charlie was watching them. Okay. Okay, uh, Pete, uh, during the burn, uh, when the engine came on, the pressure started down. Right, that's, that's, what, uh, that's what should have happened. It was at 205 uh, and 177 pre-burn and went to 197 and 170 post-burn. That's oxidizer and fuel, respectively. And that's... Okay, uh, that's what we saw. Right, and, that, and I got to say that's... Uh, that's uh, the figures look real good to them. That's the kind of performance they expected. Okay, now for LOI, uh, when the engine comes on, the helium valve's open, and I can expect the pressures to rise, and my gauge reading for oxidizer to sit around 200, and for fuel to be around uh, 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 one, uh, 175. Around one. That's 200 on oxidizer, and around 170 on fuel drain. Okay, fine. Houston, Casper. Go ahead, Casper. Could you have somebody uh, put a few words together for me on what happens if the IMU gets course aligned while average D is still on? I'm thinking about the, at the end of the burn. Okay, you're, you're wondering about the situation uh, when, uh, if you get the glitch after the burn, but while average G is still running. Yes, sir. Uh, there's no chance of terminating average G before that happens, and uh, kind of like to have some idea what I might expect the, the navigation to do. Hey, Roger, we'll, we'll get you an answer on that, Ken. Thank you, sir. Houston, can you can you check for us and uh, let us know whether Ken is on the biomed? Is Ken hooked up on the biomed? Uh, we're getting some strange readings. Could be a loose sensor. Yeah, it's pretty it's pretty loose now. It's in my pocket. It's it's in your pocket. That might account for it. I'm not ignoring your. Yeah, I'm not ignoring it. I just haven't had a chance to stop and put them on yet. I'll get to it first chance we get. Right. That's fine. Houston, over. This is 16, over. Go ahead. Uh, how's your bomb head look now? Stand by me, we'll look. We're still getting a noisy signal on the, on the biome at 16. Okay, Houston, we're maneuvering to the Sim Bay uh, door jet attitude now. Roger, copy. John, how do you read me now? Here, loud and clear. And we copied your maneuver. Okay. Roger, I, uh, I had to switch back to the Sim uh, head. The uh, lightweight headset just isn't working out. Roger. Okay, uh, 
we're going through the Simdor jet uh, checklist, and uh, I've got here uh, a list of verifies. I'm on page 1-7, step 10, and uh, it has SMAC power on, and uh, we haven't been on them. With your concurrence, I'll go ahead and turn it on now. Stand by one. Okay, Casper, you can go ahead and turn the power on. Thank you, sir. Houston, I'm ready to put the pan camera power on the power. Okay, 16, stand by a minute. Okay, uh, Casper, we don't have any pan camera data yet. Okay, I haven't put the power on yet. Um, checklist says to stand by for Misfit Q. We have the data system on, the uh, AUX TV is the SCI, and we have SMAC power on. The hand camera switches are in standby and off. Okay, Casper, uh, you can go ahead and turn the power on, and we'll cue you when, you go, when to go to boost. Okay, power's coming on. Mark. Barber pulls good. Back to gray. Roger, have it. Okay, Casper, you go for pan camera to boost. Okay. This is Apollo Control coming up on Sim Bay, our scientific instrument module bay door jettison in about uh, 10 minutes. 14 minutes, that is. Present velocity is 3,872 feet per second, ever increasing, relative to the moon. Well, uh, current height, altitude, 11,618 nautical miles. We're standing by for the Simbe door jettison. Okay, uh, Houston, uh, we go for Sim Door Jetson, over. Stand by one. Okay, uh, uh, 16, we're standing by to arm the Sim Power Buses. Okay, Houston, we're ready to arm the Sim Power Buses. Okay, I was going to hold up on that. Uh, I'll go ahead and uh, give you a logic power to Jetson this time. Roger. Here comes uh, Logic Power Jet 1 to Jet, and number 2, Jet. Okay, they're armed. Roger, we show them armed. We'll go for door jet. Okay, understand. Go for door jet. That's affirmative. Thirty seconds to door jet. Roger, thirty seconds. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, jet. There it goes. Roger. Okay, the door went. I don't think uh, anything changed much uh, from what we could tell. Roger, copy. This is Apollo Control. The Sim Bay door referred to by someone on Apollo 15. We can watch it spinning around out uh, both the center window and Charlie's window, and it's uh, quite a sight every time it comes around. The bright side fl really flashes. Roger. Simbe door was referred to by someone on Apollo 15 as the world's largest lens cap. At the time of jettison, the spacecraft was uh, 11,142 nautical miles out from the moon, approaching at a velocity of 3,896 feet per second. 
Okay, uh, Houston, uh, that was a pretty good bang. Roger. The reason it was is on account of we were uh, standing around here in our underwear, you know. That is helmets and gloves off. Right, copy that. And uh, I guess the, the sound that... The sound of it was about uh, half of what you hear when the uh, when you're in the lab and uh, and uh, the CMP's in here and he hears the uh, pressure rec the pressure release valve closed on him. Roger. Captain repress valve that is. Okay, Don. All of the uh, simply configuration has been completed. If you want to take a look at the data and see if there's anything that uh, looks funny to you, I can recheck it. Okay, Casper, stand by one. We'll take a look. Okay, we're going P-52 attitude now. Roger, copy. P-52 attitude. Okay, uh, the door is uh, rapidly receded from us and uh, it's certainly hard to tell how far away it is, but it's uh, plenty far away. Certainly no recontact problem. Roger, COVID, and uh, Casper, the assembly looks okay. Roger, thank you. That's a good start. And we used uh, only about 15%. Uh, We're reading uh, magazine BB, 85% remaining. Magazine BB, 85%. Houston uh, 16, our lamp CM Delta P is point two, and the pressure equalization valve is open. Our cryo uh, systems are configured. Roger, copy. Lamp CM Delta P point two. 16, we've got an LOI preliminary pad, and if you'll go accept, we'll uplink uh, data. Okay, uh, go ahead to accept. Houston 16, go ahead with your pad. Roger, 16. It's LOI preliminary, SPS, GNN, 66314, plus 121, minus 014, 074, minus 27808, Minus zero two one nine or seven minus zero two five two two. Roll is all zips. Pitch zero zero one. Yaw is all zips. Noun forty four is zero one seven zero zero plus zero zero five eight. Three two eight zero zero eight six one four two seven nine or three five sextant star one six two four two nine or two seven one. The rest of the pad is in A. Set stars Sirius and Rigel one. Three two one nine or six zero zero six. Ullage none. Other limb weight three six two eight seven. Single bank burn time six two eight. Okay, Houston uh, on the P thirty pad read back preliminary LOI SPS GNN. Six six three one four plus one two one minus zero one four zero seven four two eight two five six three minus two seven eight zero eight minus zero two one nine or seven minus zero two five two two zero 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 one zero 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 one seven zero zero plus zero zero five eight three two eight eight zero eight six one four two seven nine or three five one six two four two nine or two seven one Sirius and Rigel, 132-196-006. No knowledge. Limb weight, 36287. Single bank burn time, 6 plus 28. Uh, Charlie, let's uh, check Delta VT. It should read 28. 
zero zero eight. Okay, two eight zero zero eight. Thank you. Roger, that's correct. Sixteen, you can have the computer and back to block. Casper, Houston, we haven't uh, forgotten your question about uh, what happens if the glitch occurs while Average G is running. We're still putting together a nice, neat summary for you. We'll come up with it a little later. Okay, and I guess it's uh, to tell us what the residuals are doing more than anything else. We'd like to know that. Okay. Uh, 16, uh, we're still seeing intermittent data, which indicates that one biomed sensor is probably uh, loose on the CMP. Okay, uh, Houston, uh, you've been looking at John's uh, biomed. Kent's getting uh, suited up right now with his. Okay, which one is it? CPN or uh, heart rate, or? It's, it's EKG, John. 16, you can terminate battery A charge. Okay. Go ahead, 16. Okay, in a minute and 40 seconds, the uh, boss went from 100 to 101.1. Hey, Roger, we copied and, and uh, GNC says that's okay. Sounds good to us, too. This is Apollo Control at 70 hours 51 minutes into the mission of Apollo 16. Countdown clock showing 3 hours 26 minutes remaining until the spacecraft passes behind the moon. The start of the first lunar revolution with lunar orbit insertion maneuver taking place shortly thereafter. The preliminary uh, data passed up to the crew by the spacecraft communicator a short time ago has the ignition time uh, for the lunar orbit insertion burn at 74 hours, 28 minutes, 25 seconds. This is subject to some refinement, probably within a few seconds. As we get down to the final maneuver information, which will be passed up... Uh, about, uh, here comes a voice check. Voice check. Roger, we're still here. Hey, Roger, loud and clear. The final maneuver pad will be passed up to the crew at uh, about 7320. And at the same time, the uh, times for reappearance of the spacecraft around the eastern limb of the moon will be passed up uh, to the crew with and without a successful LOI burn. There's a slight amount of concern about the sun impinging on the Simbe experiments because of the present attitude of the spacecraft and a procedure for rolling uh, out of that particular attitude is being generated now to pass up to the crew, get some of the solar heat out of the experiments. Standing by for the balance of the activities leading up to lunar orbit insertion, this is Apollo Control at 7053. Houston, uh, let me read you a note I found in the flight plan here, right at 38 hours, over. At 38 hours? That's affirmative. I woke up uh, after the first night, and I find this note in here from Kent. It says, John, it says, we have had some sort of IMU or CMC hardware problem. Right after you went to sleep at 38 hours, the platform course aligned itself. We got it back with an Earth-Sun alignment. Fortunately, MCC had high belt rate all the time and we'll work it out tomorrow. Sleep tight, sign TK. 
And I got up the next morning and I saw that in there and I said, boy, that can't sure got a funny sense of humor. Yeah, I guess we would concur with that funny sense of humor. We had some guys here laugh all night. Yeah, I, I, didn't, <laughs> I guess I didn't believe the note. <laughs> I, I can understand that. Hello, Donald. Are you still there? Affirmative, still with you. Okay, you want to have to take a look at the biomed, David? Right, Ken, we're doing that now. Uh, 16, uh, it looks like the sim bay temps are coming up a little. We may have to change our roll angle. We'll come up with uh, an angle for you in just a minute. Okay. And the biomed med data looks good now. Okay, uh, 16, we want you to go to a roll of zero, two, zero, with the same pitch and yaw angles that you have now. And you should be able to do the P-52 in the new attitude, and the high gain should stay locked up. Roger. You're very, very weak. Say again. I said, uh, we're there. I guess your temps will be stabilizing now. Roger, copy. Don, how about if we go ahead and do our P-52s now? Okay, go ahead, kid. that you are going to load the, the DAP and then the EMP-509 before you do the P-52. That's in work right now. Roger, thank you. Yeah, I guess you saw us get out of sequence there a little, but we're, we're back on now. Roger, we understand. Uh, Casper, uh, hold up on your procedure there a minute. Casper, apparently it's necessary to load the normal DAP before you load the EMP because once you've loaded the Saturn DAP, the limb weights and that sort of thing will not be accepted by the CMC. So we'd like to have you take the EMP out, load the normal DAP, then load the EMP back in. Uh, we should have told you about that earlier, I guess. It slipped by. Well, that's okay. I stopped and wondered about it, and then I decided I couldn't think of any reason why it wouldn't work the way we did it. Okay, we're back in sync now. Now we can start with 509. Is that firm? Uh, you've loaded the, the normal DAP now. That's firm. Uh, extend by just a minute. We're looking at it. Okay, Ken, it uh, looks real good, and you can go ahead now with the EMP and the P-52. Okay, will do. It is, I kind of like this attitude you picked on. Uh, it's got the old Earth and the uh, telescope. Hey, Very wonderful. Pretty. Uh, Flatboard says you should be just about right, over Africa. Like this attitude for aesthetic reasons. Well, it's hard. I guess that, uh, that sort of syncs up. Right. Uh, Tom, would you ask uh, guys to take a look at, I'm sure it's a 
typical thing. I just never noticed. Uh, I was watching the Optic Zero the other night and used 1691 as a way to do that. And uh, here again, I, I watched it, and uh, at the completion of the Zero, it looks like it went to uh, the Register 2 display now. And uh, I'm still in Zero. I just thought that was kind of curious. Is that a bit size or something? Stand by one, we'll look at it. I'm taking it out of zero now, that's why it's counting. I'm going to go ahead with the 52. I understand you're taking it out of zero now. It was out of zero when it started counting. It went from uh, uh, 403 up to what you see now. Roger. And that's uh, due to trying to get tripped. Roger. Is there any reason to torque these before getting ready to go to an option one? Stand by a minute. Go ahead and torque them. And uh, Ken, could you uh, check your your mic placement? You're very, very weak. Okay, Don. Is that any better? Hey, that's some better, Kim. Thank you. Yeah, I'm going to torque them at 2310. Roger. Mm -hmm. Don, just out of more academic interest, it turns out that the T-Packs and the, and the Now 91s are exactly the same. Roger, I understand. Yeah, Don, what I was going to say is that the, the T-Packs on the, on the shaft uh, are within you know, the readability of the disking. The uh, trunnion then seems to be off by about uh, 200, which I think is a uh, pretty fine agreement. And uh, to the interest of some of those people uh, who are talking about these optics and whether they drift or not, if you can watch 1691 right now, you'll find that I'm in mode is manual, and I'm in direct, and you can watch them uh, drift slowly, and at low rate, I'll go to resolve, and uh, they drift at uh, approximately the same rate. So I, there seems to be some question about that earlier, I thought some of the guys in the back might be interested in that. Roger, Kevin. Thank you. Okay, uh, Casper, uh, for your information, uh, although we had you go ahead and load EMP 509 prior to the P-52, it was not absolutely necessary at that point because you did this P-52 under SCS control. And any time you're under SCS control, that TVC relay is not enabled. So you really don't have the problem. There's no way the glitch can get to you. We, wanted, we had to have the EMP-509 loaded eventually, so we figured we'd go ahead and let you get it in now. Okay. I understand that. Uh, thank you very much. Right. But, uh, with all this stuff uh, over the next few days, uh, it wouldn't hurt uh, to keep a list of those things down there and kind of, kind of stay with me on these things, make sure I don't get one of those things. Hey, Roger. We'll follow you. Casper Houston, uh, when you've got a few minutes to talk, we've got a little philosophy philosophy on the use of EMP 509 in lunar orbit. <laughs> okay, can you stand by just a minute, please? You're right, we'll do. Uh, Pete, we we moved the uh, E period up a little bit. We're getting all the food ready here. Oh, hey, Roger. Uh, this can stand by for quite a while. Okay, I'll come back to you in about uh, 10 minutes with all that. Okay, Ken, good enough. Thank you. Okay, Don, I'm, uh, I got some free hands now and got my little notepad out. 
and I'm ready to listen and uh, copy and discuss anything you got on this stuff. Okay, I guess, Ken, the first thing we'll talk about is the use of the EMP in lunar orbit. That is, when you're when you're alone in the spacecraft. Uh, we, we do not plan to run EMP-509 continuously, primarily because uh, if you do, you don't have a gimbal lock, true gimbal lock protection. Uh, what we will do is we will run it during programs that involve TVC enable relay cycling, except for P-52. Now, that means that we will run it for SPS burns, and you already have the procedures for LOI and DOI. And for other burns, the procedures will stay the same, except that we may change the time sequences for doing some of the items. Uh, we will also run the EMP-509 for P-24 and uh, for uh, rendezvous, and we're having uh, MIT verify the compatibility at the present time. We'll come back to you on those with more details later. And during P-52 with the P-20 option 5, uh, our current procedures call for going CMC free. Uh, instead of doing that, what we'll do is we'll go to this uh, spacecraft control, SCS, put the rate switch high and BMAG mode rate 2, and that way the rate damping level is below your orb rate. And so your SCS, as far as control is concerned, will be equivalent to CMC free. However, by going to SCS control, uh, if you want to check back on that list of set and reset uh, conditions, you'll find it. By going to SCS control, we eliminate the possibility of getting this glitch. Okay, would you say again how we're going to handle P Normally, P20 option 5, we will not use 509, is that correct? That's affirmative. We will not use uh, 509 during P20 option 5. Okay, and when we come to do a P52, we will still not use the option, uh, uh, the 509, we're going to go to SCS control and use the uh, rate high and max dead band. Is that correct? Okay, uh, rate high and max dead band is okay, but uh, the uh, GNC tells me you really, that the dead band, you don't need to go to max. It's, it's kind of immaterial which position you put that switch in. You do need the rate switch in high and you need BMAG mode uh, rate 2. That way you don't have an attitude uh, control situation. You have a rate control situation, but the uh, level is high enough that it's uh, well above the orb rate, and so the SCS will be equivalent to going CMC free. Okay, I understand that. Thank you. Okay, okay. I'll, I'll leave it in uh, dead band man, and rate high. Roger, and uh, we'll get more uh, details to you later on the P-24 in the rendezvous. Okay. Doing good work. All right. uh, Ken, there's one other comment here. Uh, if you are going to, at some point in lunar orbit, do quite a bit of optics switching, uh, like manual and automatic and that sort of thing. We would suggest in that case that you load EMP-509 before you start playing with the optics and take it out again when you're finished. Okay, anytime we're doing that, I assume that means like in, uh, when we're doing the uh, landmark tracking, both high and low. And um, it's my understanding from the comments we've got now that the only time 509 can get me in trouble is if I leave it enabled during thrusting. Uh, that in and general... also loses the automatic gimbal stop. Uh, that's absolutely correct, Ken. Now, those are the two cases. All right, sir. Thank you very much. And you might uh, tell Tom Holloway that his little notepad has really come in handy. That's super. Uh, he's sitting here smiling and giving me the thumbs up right now. 
Charlie just asked that everybody lock the doors until he finds his pea suit. This is Apollo Control. 72 hours, one minute. Ground elapsed time. Two hours, 15 minutes prior to the time Apollo 16 passes behind the moon for the beginning of the first lunar orbit. Crew has moved up their meal period a few moments earlier been scheduled in the flight plan and are now having their noon meal. Spacecraft presently 6,322 nautical miles out from the moon, approaching at a velocity of 4,281 feet per second. Continuing to stand by as we uh, approach lunar orbit. Maneuver for lunar orbit coming up in uh, a few hours, about uh, two hours and 26 minutes from now. 7202, this is Apollo Control. John, how about if I uh, put off uh, this game ray shield thing for another uh, 10 minutes? Let's get that one. Okay, we're going to go ahead and get it up. Okay. Shield is off at this time. We'll turn it back in uh, 10 minutes. Roger. And 16, I've got a TEI 4 pad if you're ready to come. He caught us at dessert. Roger, we'll stand back. Okay, uh, Pete, go ahead with your P-30 pad. Stand by just a minute, Charlie. Okay, Charlie. TEI-4, SPS, GNN, 41534, plus 064, plus 135. 083-07-1413 plus 32896 plus 11501 minus 03276 181 056 022 the rest of the pad is N.A. Set stars Sirius and Rigel. 131071014. Hullage, 2 jet, 17 seconds. Under other, 1, burn undocked. 2, assumes no DOI. Three assumes landing site refs met. Four with LOI refs met. Roll one seven nine. Pitch one eight three. Yaw zero one four. Okay. Uh Houston, uh, TEI-4 is SPSGNN 41534 plus 064 plus 135, 083, 07, 143, plus 32896 plus 11501 minus 0327 6, 181-056-022. Assumes no DOI, three landing site rest mat, four LOI rest mats, one seven nine one eight three zero one four over. Uh, that's affirmative, Charlie. Uh, Pete, uh, 16 here, looking through the telescope, but the uh, Earth is sure apparent that we live on a pretty planet. The colors are just such more, such more, such a lot more vivid <laughs> than uh, any of the photographs. Roger, we understand. We were just enjoying some of the beauties of Earth ourselves. Nope, 
got any news there with coffee, huh? Yeah, that's a Bernie. Or why do you do people? How many pots has the smoker gone through already? We'll have to get you a count, but Jerry says it's a new record. Sixteen Houston, I've got a map update, uh, Rev 1. It's at about 7320 in the flight plan. And also I've got uh, some answers to Ken's earlier question about this uh, glitch and what if it occurs uh, following a burn. Okay, map update Rev 1, LOS 071741, 180 degrees 0743139, AOS with LOI 0745005, without LOI 074208. Okay, 0741741, 0743139, 0745005008, that's it for me. Okay, now Ken, on this other question, as we understood your question, you're concerned about what happens after, at 2.5 seconds after the burn, when you switch back to the RCS DAP and uh, cycle this relay, what happens if you get the glitch? And it looks like there are two cases. Either you get a, a yaw glitch of sufficient magnitude to put you into course align, or you get some kind of glitch that could be in roll pitch or yaw, but does not put you into course align. If you go into course align, the nav is no good, and the noun 85s are no good. And in that case, we'd like you to exit average G as soon as possible uh, by, by exiting the program. If you're not in chorus align, the nav is good, but the noun 85s are still no good. Okay. Okay, we got you. Roger. Uh, I'm particularly in the LOI since there's no trim. Uh, that's uh, only a problem for, for recording purposes, anyhow. Roger, that's correct. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, 16 Houston, I've got uh, three items to go in the flight plan at uh, about 79.29 is the first one. And if we can get these in, that'll finish up the flight plan updates for today. Okay, press on. Okay, at 7929, right at the bottom of the page there, we want to add load EMP 509. And at 7939... Ahead of or behind the load down 89. That's affirmative. Uh, after, it should follow the load now in 89. Okay, I've added load 509 after load now in 89. Uh, that's affirmative. And at 7938, we want to delete the verb 48 there. And that's not associated with the 509. That's simply because that's redundant. You're already in that DAP configuration. And at 7942, right after the, the misspent update block there, uh, add terminate EMP 509 after P24 completed. Okay, terminate 509 after P24 is completed. Now let me, is that the last one or you got some more? That's all of them. Okay, let me read them back to you where I've got them, make sure I have it all right. At about uh, 
29 and a half on a page I've written load 509. I have deleted the verb 48, which occurs at 79.38. At 79.41.42, I've got terminate 509 after P24 is completed. That's correct, yeah. Okay, thank you. And on, uh, on this first rev, if we uh, wanted to take some uh, pictures or something, um, can we stick with magazine November, November? I can't tell right now what that's scheduled for, or should we use magazine Victor? Stand by, we'll let you know. Thank you, sir. Uh, Casper, November, November looks pretty low on the pad. Uh, you should go to Magazine Victor. Thank you. Okay, thanks. 16 Houston, we've got a couple more words on the limb paint peeling problem. Apparently, uh, it has been duplicated now in a vacuum chamber. Uh, and it does not appear to be any kind of a problem as far as emission is concerned. Well, that's fine to hear. Thank you, now. Right. It's not. It's nothing leaking. It's just the paint itself. Okay. Don, uh, we're getting ready to start into the uh, secondary glycol loop check. Okay, we're ready to follow. Okay, the secondary cool loop pump is uh, about to go off. Roger. Pump AC one's on on secondary loop. Roger. Okay, we see the outlet temperature decreasing. Roger. Uh, 16, are y'all uh, satisfied with the uh, nitrogen pressures in the SPS? That's affirmative. Thank you. Houston, uh, Lim, uh, CM Delta P is 0.2 again. Roger, Lim, CM Delta P, 0.2. I just uh, got my head unlocked and pointed it out of window number one, and we have a half moon in Earthshine. It is really pretty. Roger. You can see basins. You can see all the, you know, you can see all the prominent features and little sharp craters like uh, I think I'm looking at Kepler that's out there in the middle of the Mars. It's just beautiful, and it's all Earthshine. Roger. Yeah, it, it, it just about, it's like uh, two-thirds of the window, and I got my head no more than six inches from it. Yeah. And on the, on the uh, dark side, uh, you can see a big dark disk, and I think the reason I can see it is it's the solar corona that's illuminating uh, around the back side. And I can see a star within, uh, well, I'll bet you it's within a degree of the uh, moon's disk. Roger. Could we have the LMP confirm that that's really the moon and not the Earth you're looking at? Hey, babe, this is really the moon. It's the most awe-inspiring sight I've ever seen in my life. Looks like the the orb is just hung out there in uh, the middle of blackness. It's really beautiful, Pete. Right. And you can make out all the features on the thing. I can see humoral, and you can see up into the Procolarum and in the basins in there. And you can even see the outer rings of Oriental. In the, you can't see the basin itself, but you can see its outer rings. Sounds beautiful, Ken. Yeah. Now, uh, looking at our present uh, orientation, I can tell that uh, our new attitude will be perfect for LOI. Roger. Okay, we're Ken, just for your information, the 
reading that you got when you zeroed the optics on the now 91s there was, was is considered normal. And uh, it's uh, like a, a single bit or less than a single bit error. And the uh, other thing I wanted to pass on was that this EMP 509 has been verified by MIT for use with uh, P24 and during rendezvous. Okay, thank you. Don, we're going to waste the two frames of VHBW. Could you tell me if it's better to, to use SS or TT? If you dial channel 6, you can see a plot of the parameters on the primary coolant. Magazine TT, Ken. We copy. Okay, I'm uh, up to three exposures on magazine TT. Roger. Houston 16, do you have any objections to our going to the burn attitude now? Stand by a minute. Was that affirmative or a negative? Over. Stand by one. Sixteen, give us poo and accept, and we'll give you your uplinks, and then you can maneuver. And the reason we uh, would like to go now is it looks to, to me like you can't get there without going through Gimbal Lock. Well, we want to see what the DAP wants us to do. Roger, understand. Okay, 16, uh, you can start maneuvering and uh, we'll help you watch the Gimbal Lock situation. And also have an LOI pad when you're, whenever you're ready to copy. Okay, LOI, SPS, GNN, 66314, plus 121, minus 014, 074, 282722, minus 27816. Minus zero two one nine six minus zero two five six two zero 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 one zero 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 noun forty fours zero one seven zero zero plus zero zero five eight three Two eight zero two zero six one four two seven nine or four seven sextant star one six two four two nine or two seven one the rest of the pad is in a set star is Sirius and Rigel one three two one nine or six Zero zero six. Ullage none. Limb weight three six two eight seven. Single bank burn time six two eight. Okay, we copy LOI SPS GNN six six three one four plus one two one minus zero one four. Zero seven four two eight two seven two two minus two seven eight one six minus zero two one nine or six minus zero two five six two zero 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 one zero 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 one seven zero zero plus zero zero five eight three two eight zero two zero six one four two seven nine or four seven one six two four two nine or two seven one rest of the pad is in a Sirius and Rigel, 132-196-006. No knowledge, mem weight, 36287. Single bank burn time, 628, over. That's a permanent, Charlie.
Omni Delta 16, Omni Delta. signal clock in the control center here. To review some of the uh, upcoming numbers with the lunar orbit insertion maneuver, ignition time will be at 74, 28, 74 hours, 28 minutes, 27 seconds around the lapse time about 10 minutes from now. The uh, total delta V, or velocity change, will be uh, 2,802 feet per second, feet per second in uh, retrograde. Apollo 16, uh, at the end of the burn, will be in a lunar orbit measuring 58.3 nautical miles at Paracynthian and 170 nautical miles at Epicynthian. Total burn time with the 2,000 pound thrust, uh, 20,000 pound thrust uh, service propulsion system engine will be 6 minutes 14 seconds. With a successful lunar orbit insertion burn, the spacecraft will be acquired again by the Manned Spaceflight Tracking Network at a ground elapsed time of 74 hours, 50 minutes, 5 seconds. But in the uh, remote chance that there is not a burn, no ignition for some reason, the time without a burn would be 74 hours, 42 minutes, 8 seconds. Estimated impact time for the S-4B third stage of the Saturn V, which propelled Apollo 16 on its way to the moon. That impact time now is uh, 75 hours 0703, and because of no tracking available over the last uh, day or two, this is an estimate based on the last predictions will not be uh, within the field of view of the spacecraft, even though they will be coming around uh, the front side of the moon at that time. It will be over the spacecraft's horizon. 
the si seismometers from the earlier Apollo lunar surface experiment packages left on the moon by earlier missions will be monitored to uh, detect the S-4B impact, which uh, would be equivalent to about 11 tons of TNT. Some 29 minutes away from acquisition of signal, assuming a nominal lunar orbit insertion burn, and 7 minutes, 17 seconds away from ignition on lunar orbit insertion. Come back up again uh, prior to AOS, or acquisition of Apollo 16, as it comes around the east side of the moon. And at 74.21, ground elapsed time, this is Apollo Control. Impact time, 75 hours 0703. One of the large uh, television rear projection Ida 4 machines. It does carry the uh, seismometer trace from one of the earlier Apollo lunar surface experiment packages. And the flight controllers here in the controls room will be watching that with interest as we approach the uh, impact time. at 74.34 and returning at the no burn AOS time in some seven minutes. This is Apollo Control. This is Apollo Control at 74 hours 41 minutes ground elapsed time. Less than a minute away from the uh, time at which the spacecraft should come around the uh, corner of the moon, assuming we had not a successful uh, lunar orbit insertion burn. The uh, acquisition time with a normal burn would be at 74 hours, 50 minutes, 5 seconds, some 8 minutes and 8 seconds away from this point. Mark. No noise on the downlink. Apparently, uh, spacecraft did have a successful burn. To repeat the acquisition time with a successful burn, 74 hours, 50 minutes, 5 seconds. At 74.42 ground elapsed time, this is Apollo Control. A minute away from uh, acquisition of signal from Apollo 16, and it appears, uh, at least from the timing, that uh, we have indeed had a successful lunar orbit insertion burn, which, uh, according to pre-burn planning, should produce an, an elliptical orbit ar around the moon with a paracynthian of 58.3 nautical miles and an apocynthian of 170 nautical miles. We'll stand by here for the first words from the crew and the burn report. Display is being changed here in the control center from the Earth-Moon transit display in the center scribing plotter to the lunar orbit plotter. Mark zero. Let's leave the line up now. Have confirmed AOS. Hello, Houston. Uh, Sweet 16 has arrived. Roger, 16. Copy, loud and clear. Okay, uh, Pete, uh, super double fantastic burn. Uh, if you're ready, I'll give you a burn status report. 
Okay, go ahead, John. Okay, uh, Delta TIG was zero, 615, burn, 615.1 burn time, plus 28039er. Plus point two, minus zero, minus uh, point one. Delta VC is minus five point five. Fuel three seven six. Ox three seven one. Hundred and fifty unbalanced. Decrease. Okay, at ignition, we got a momentary SPS light. Then it went out. During the burn, the oxidizer pressure read uh, two hundred. The fuel side was a little bit low. It was about one hundred and sixty-five on my gauge. After the shutdown, the fuel side climbed to 170. The oxidizer went to about 202 with an SPS light, and we still got it. Over. Roger. We copied uh, everything except uh, roll, pitch, and yaw, which is blocked out by some noise. Okay. Uh, the trim attitude, we did not trim. Uh, the residuals were as we gave you after the burn. But our attitude was uh, 005. Three five eight zero zero two over. Roger, we coming. And it was a slight uh, transient when the uh, second bank was lit. That uh, I don't remember from previous burns. You might look at that data, but it was super. Right, coming. And it appeared to me that the uh, chamber pressure dropped off uh, just as we brought the second bank on. And uh, as you can see, we're at 170.4 by 58.3, according to the old computer. And that baby just rifled it right down the line. Already? And everybody's looking out the window. And right now, we're looking right down at uh, Crater King. And it's just as fantastic as it always has been. Roger. You can see those little dark, uh, those little dark, look like volcanic, uh, black spots uh, up up in the north sector of it and you can see the central peaks with a with a very uh, very white central peaks covered by uh, lighter uh, gray gray brown uh, material it sort of looked like somebody painted it on there with a uh, with a with a paintbrush and uh, Pete, your first view at uh, Siakowski, uh, from my one, is pretty, it's, it's a spectacular sight. Uh, with that, uh, it's like a uh, marshmallow float to Central Peak floating in the top of a hot chocolate. Yeah, you, it, it's like uh, you, three guys, and he's got a window, and we're staring at the, at the ground. It's really, uh, boy, this has got to be the neatest way to make a living anybody's ever invented. Uh, Pete, uh, 16 here, another pretty sight we had before burn was the uh, earth set that uh, really quite a view. Hey, we're all sitting here listening, Charlie. Tell us about it. Uh, Pete, you got the uh, map, uh, pan camera power is, uh, is on. Okay, pan camera power on. IDS 4B look. Uh, it hadn't happened yet, uh, John. It's about another nine minutes or so. I, I trust we're not getting there at the same time it does. I trust. Okay. Hey, it's going to hit on the southwest corner of Reinhold. Thank you, Pete. Tell Ken it's going to hit on the southwest corner of Reinhold. He should know where that is. I'm sure he does. Okay. We uh, get the binoculars out here playing with them. It's uh, pretty interesting. I tell you, all that time spent with Farouk uh, sure is going to pay off because it does look like old home. That's good, Like the lawn needs mowing and all that. Okay, Casper, pan camera power off. Roger. This is Apollo Control, 75 hours, one minute ground elapsed time. Completely successful lunar orbit insertion burn with a duration of 6 minutes and 15 seconds. Report.
recorded uh, onboard measurements of the lunar orbit, 58.3 by 170.4 nautical miles. We'll continue to uh, monitor this first frontside pass in lunar orbit number one. At 7502, this is Apollo Control. Uh, Pete, looking out uh, at the horizon, you can really tell uh, you're in the islands. Uh, the uh, horizon is really jagged looking. Looks like coming up on the Rockies, huh? Of course, we're starting we're start to come up over the flatlands now, over the Smith Sea. I remember a landmark a track down there on Apollo 10 is still there. And you can't really tell by looking at it that the Smith Sea is any any deeper or lower as the data shows it is right. in the surrounding terrain. Roger. The uh, submerged craters in Smithy uh, remind me a lot of uh, Carl Atolls. They just got the uh, ridges sticking up, you know, and the, and the bottoms up, up here to be flooded with the same uh, material that's in the smell. We're digging out a map now, 16, to take a look at. We're going to get a close-in picture of Humboldt here as we come up, because uh, it's probably missing on the next round. Roger. That's real, it's really a fascinating crater, the way the uh, dark mare has got uh, in the... Uh, sort of like a path around the edges and, and there's a, a fracture pattern uh, running across it and it has some uh, very uh, prominent central peaks that are very white but it has every uh, contrasted color on the moon. Roger. Boy, those uh, fracture patterns running down through it are, are white, uh, appear to be white uh, layered fracture patterns. They look like somebody drawn them on there with a piece of chalk. Yes, 4B is impacted. Okay. Seismograph trace is beginning to show of the S4B impact at approximately 7509 ground elapsed time. Uh, Houston, I'm I want to find that we got uh, Batavius uh, with its central dome of uh, whitish cap. Uh, Dome and it's a fairly subdued crater. The uh, lineations running into it, uh, the rails or whatever they are, are uh, just like it's drawn on the map here. And some of those central domes are exceptionally dark, and they have exceptionally dark material running down a white uh, surface. And you can see that. With the binoculars, we passed over. Uh, Langrenus, and you can see blocks on the tops of the central peak, and some features that probably are there that I just hadn't noticed before in that central feature. You can see an awful lot of, looks like a, the demarcation where the central feature looks like a crack in it, has a whole ring of uh, craters that kind of dots that boundary. And then you see uh, some more of those little craters up along near the top of the central liniment also. And uh, you just don't see those kind of things stand out at you without the binoculars. Roger. Also say that the binoculars at 10 power are the maximum you can hold in your hand. you got to get yourself set up very nicely for it before you start. Roger. And we're coming up over the Messier A and B craters. This is Apollo Control at 75 hours, 18 minutes. Ground elapsed time. Crew of Apollo 16 still... Three tourists in their first lunar orbit, observing the features of the moon, calling out the various craters as they pass over them. S4B uh, impacted the lunar surface at uh, about 7509. Signals are still coming to the ALSEP, coming out on the recording graph. Uh, the normal Lunar seismic activity made a uh, rather straight line up until the time of impact, and uh, the strokes of the recorder are broadening continuously as the seismic waves travel through the moon to the ALSEP site. 
some 55 minutes until loss of signal remaining in this first lunar orbit. At 75.19, this is Apollo Control. This is the this is Apollo Control at 75.20. Apollo 16 Commander John Young becomes the first human to go into lunar orbit twice, having flown on Apollo 10, which is a precursor to the landing missions. Apollo 10 mission descended to uh, within about eight miles of the lunar surface in the, uh, that is, the lunar module did. Jim Lovell has been to the moon twice, but the second trip, the first having been Apollo 8, the first manned lunar orbit mission, the second being in uh, Apollo 13, which uh, was an aborted mission and uh, coasted past the moon, and therefore Lovell did not go into lunar orbit on his second trip. At 7521, this is Apollo Control. Uh, Houston, we're coming up on uh, Theophilus now. Central Peaks in the shadows, and the uh, we approach the Terminator, looking out towards the horizon. It uh, uh, really looks rugged. Roger. This is Apollo Control. Members of the Orange team of flight controllers under um, Pete Frank are beginning to drift into the room for the change of shift handover at 4 p.m. Central Time. We're estimating the change of shift press briefing in the small briefing room, Building 1 Press Center, for 4 o'clock, somewhat earlier than would be normal, normally the case, with uh, Flight Director uh, Jerry Griffin. Uh, 16, uh, if you'll give us a computer and go accept, we'll uh, give you a rest, man. You got it. Just now looking at the Altai Scarp, and boy, it's well named to this lighting. Roger. Looks like the walls are vertical. I'll admit the lighting exaggerates it, but that's how it looks. Roger, copy. At 16, we're finished with the uplink. Okay, back to block. In this lighting, uh, you can see uh, the crater Descartes it stands out uh, much bigger than you would expect because of the low sun angle. And uh, I had to look at the, my map in order to make sure that's what I was looking at. And uh, the material that uh, runs out of it that, that's in the area, so the things we talk about as being that bright reflective area, in this low sun angle uh, has a much uh, blockier and jumbled appearance than uh, it does on any of the high sun photographs. Roger. It looks very much like looking down on a clinkery, uh, uh, a big clinkery center field, but on a much larger scale. Roger, copy. Yeah, big, oh. big rounded uh, surface uh, clinkers. Uh, that's fantastic. Boy, is that rough. Okay, Houston, as we uh, look to the west and past the Terminator, there's a couple of degrees past the Terminator. There's one bright spot, the uh, peak, standing up, which is uh, west of uh, uh, west of Con. Charlie, you're fading up. Really high ground. Say again? Right after you started talking about this peak and you said something like west of, you faded out. Go ahead, Jerry. Yeah, the general opinion here is that we may be looking at part of Smoky Mountain sticking up through through the shadow. Right there. Uh, 16 FAO advises uh, you've got uh, some extra film on magazine UU. It's BHBW and you can use it for targets of opportunity. And uh, you can use the CEX exposure graph and stop down one stop from what you get off the graph. Okay, I hear you. And Casper, on that last transmission, uh, as an example, uh, F11 for the CEX should go to F16 to use with magazine UU. Okay. 
Lost down. I'd like to verify how we're going to do the P-52 again now. The idea is that we'll go to uh, place the FCS controls into rate high, and uh, dip band is pin. At the proper time, I'll, uh, I've got the BMAX in rate two. I'll go to FCS control, and then I don't have to worry about loading 509, and I'll just go ahead and do the P-52. And then when we're through, I can go back to CMC control. Is that correct? That's uh, affirmative. All right, sir. Thank you. This is Apollo control at uh, 7539, ground elapsed time. Apollo 16 approaching the lunar terminator, or sundown, in about uh, four minutes. At the present time, the crew is conducting uh, program 52 uh, realignment of the inertial measuring unit, inertial measurement unit in the guidance system. To uh, repeat again the chain of shift pref Press briefing with Flight Director Jerry Griffin will be around 4 o'clock Central Time at the uh, Houston News Center briefing room at 7539. This is Apollo Control. Hey, Dom, we're trying to set up the, the camera for the next uh, Terminator at sunrise. And uh, I thought I understood what you told me about the settings, but I guess I don't. Could you run through that again? I guess I just assume have you just give me the proper settings. Uh, you're talking about this magazine UU that I just called up? Yes, sir, the VHBW. Roger, stand by. Huh? Ken, they're, they're get, looking it up for us right now, and in the meantime, I'll try to give you the rule again. Maybe that'll clear it up some. You can use that CEX exposure graph that you have on board and take the readings off of that right. and then simply increase the stop number one stop. For example, if the CEX exposure graph calls for F11 uh, and you're going to use the magazine UU, you should go to F16. Instead of VHBW. That's affirmative. He's right. And uh, Casper, for the Terminator photography on the next rev, uh, we're recommending you go ahead and use magazine SS. That's Sierra, Sierra. Okay, uh, use the one we planned on. That's affirmative. Casper, the call on magazine UU, we meant to uh, impart to uh, tell you that you can use that for targets of opportunity. Right. Okay. Thank you. Right. 16, put the high gain on auto. Houston, did you copy our torque angle? Affirmative. We got him. Say again, please. Affirmative, we got him. Okay, Don, uh, one comment. I'll try again to uh, take a look at the optics in the, when we get out into the double number. But uh, right now in the telescope, I, I can see the stars now, but I still can't see star patterns like we looked at, uh, at Antares, and you just couldn't see the scorpion at all. And uh, that may be due to the extreme amount of uh, earth shine that's being reflected off of the limb. That limb is like looking at it almost in the daylight. And, uh, good gosh, the, the moon looks like you can see everything on there, just like, uh, it's really bright. All right. Okay, Ken, we understand. This is Apollo Control. Uh, we're ready to switch now to the MSC News Center briefing room for our change of shift briefing. Uh, during the course of that uh, briefing, we'll be recording air-to-ground uh, conversations with the crew for playback immediately following. At 76 hours, 9 minutes, this is Apollo Control, Houston. Alrighty, uh, change of shift press briefing, uh, goal team 
Flight Director Jerry Griffin on my far right, and the uh, Gold Team Guidance, Navigation, and Control Officer Larry Kanan, spelled C-A-N-I-N, on my immediate right. Jerry, why don't you just sort of ramble down through? This is Apollo Control at 76 hours 27 minutes. During our change of shift uh, briefing, uh, Apollo 16 went behind the moon uh, during the end now of their first revolution of the moon. And uh, we accumulated a, a small amount of taped conversation uh, with the crew as they went around the corner on this first revolution, which we'll uh, play back for you at this time. Uh, 16, you're about uh, a couple of minutes from LOS. Everything's looking good. And uh, while you're behind the moon, we'll change shift and pick you up on the next trip. Okay, uh, we sure enjoyed it and really appreciate all the things that uh, you guys are doing to get us into orbit here. Man, I don't... That's the kind of help that uh, really does it for us. Thank you much. Thank you, thank you. We'll be reacquiring Apollo 16 in uh, about 30 minutes. At the present time, Flight Director Pete Frank is uh, reviewing the mission status with uh, each of his flight controllers. Our uh, spacecraft communicator at this time is uh, astronaut uh, Hank Hartsfield. And our uh, tracking data uh, shows Apollo 16 to be in an orbit with uh, an apolloon of 169.9 nautical miles, a paralloon of 58.1. At uh, 76 hours 29 minutes, this is Apollo Control. This is Apollo Control at 76 hours 57 minutes. Uh, we're now less than one minute from the scheduled time of reacquiring Apollo 16, the spacecraft now in its second revolution of the moon. And toward the end of this uh, revolution, the crew will be performing the descent orbit insertion maneuver. Uh, the flight dynamics officer here in the control center is presently working up the final set of numbers for that burn. Uh, it will be uh, performed with the spacecraft service propulsion system engine at uh, approximately 78 hours 35 minutes. Uh, this will be a 24.1 second uh, burn and will uh, be targeted to place the spacecraft in, a, in an orbit of about 59 by 11 nautical miles. Uh, we expect we'll have the final numbers uh, for that maneuver in about 15 minutes. At the present time, we show Apollo 16 in an, or in an orbit of uh, approximately 170 by 58 nautical miles. And we've just had the call uh, acquisition of signals, so we'll stand by for a call to the crew. Houston 16. Hello, 16. Houston, how do you read? Trying to transmit, we heard a little noise on the loop there, and looks like our data was dropping in. That looks good now. All right, negative. We weren't trying to say anything, Hank. Okay. We just uh, can't find any words. Everybody's peeking out the window here. Enthusiastic descriptions of the lunar surface have come from all three uh, crewmen. Most recently, we heard from John Young and uh, Charlie Duke. 
the noise on the communication circuit at the present time is due to the fact that we're using uh, one of the Omni antennas aboard the spacecraft uh, for our communications. Uh, the crew will be switching over to the high gain antenna uh, soon, and that uh, should quiet things down quite a bit. Okay, Houston, uh, we had you on the high gain. How do you read over? Okay, reading you five by five. Okay, Hank, I'm turning the pan camera to uh, mode to stand by to power on. Roger. Hank, uh, I'm sure they've been described before, but the uh, most, to me, the most unique craters up here, uh, two that uh, uh, we're just going over now that uh, our uh, objective blanket is completely white with a white interior, but with a black rim to them. Uh, Houston 16. Go ahead. Hey, Hank, how did the SPS data look? Okay, we were just talking about that, Charlie. Apparently we had a real nominal burn. Our uh, data down here showed a burn time of six minutes 14.2 seconds which is right on the money and I got a few words on that PC drop I understand that that's completely normal for the first uh, dual bank burn due to some helium bubbles that are normally trapped uh, between the ball valves so that wasn't unexpected for the first dual bank burn you shouldn't see it again and as far as the SPS pressure light that came on we warned you earlier to expect that due to the pressure surge or the tanks pressurizing we you were right on the 200 psi limit that triggered it the second pressure light you got which i apparently still on is due to heat soak uh, back into the tank so it's not unexpected either okay fine uh we passed that word on to you about the light uh, not that we weren't expecting it but just to tell you what had happened okay 16, track mode auto on the high game. Okay. You got it. Houston, 16, over. Go ahead. That uh, crater Icarus, we got a profile picture of. It's a, it's a big, uh, a round crater, and it has real uh, steep walls. And a central peak is a, uh, is a, the central peak is a little above the, the crater walls, and you'll see that profile when you get the picture back. But the shape of the central peak is such that the only earth analog I've ever seen look like is a, sort of a shield volcano. I never saw anything like that in a, you know, I'm not saying the whole thing's not an impact, but that central peak is really unusual. Roger, we copy, and, uh, we're also through with the pan camera. You can go power off on that. Uh, Houston, uh, apparently this line of secondaries down here across the Mari and gives you the impression that there's been a couple of great big chickens have been walking across there. Uh, Roger. And that, that was courtesy of Charlie Duke, our airborne geologist and chicken farmer. Roger, maybe you better watch your step. I'm watching. Those last two picturesque descriptions, uh, first of the crater Icarus with its unusual central peak, and uh, second of the chicken tracks were from John Young. Hank, uh, you can tell Farouk that uh, those smooth areas we thought we saw around uh, Isidora's Capella are indeed uniquely different in texture. They are uh, quite smooth. We'll get a chance to play with them later. Hey, that sounds real interesting, Ken. How are your systems checks coming? Right, uh, Hank, we've already finished those. Okay. Ken Mattingly's reference uh, on that last observation was to Farouk El Baz. Uh, one of the geologists who has worked very closely with the crew, and particularly with Mattingly, in uh, training him for the uh, orbital photography and uh, recognition of geologic landmarks on the moon. Henry, the amount of, of Terminator movement in one rev is kind of dramatic up here. 
last time around, the cart just barely showed as a crater. Uh, but it showed very dramatically, and now it's uh, as it moves out, it's starting to lose some of the starkness. And I'll get a, a picture of this uh, right zone, and it sure looks right now like the material that's just to the north of the crater day cart, and that stuff we talked about going between uh, Delon uh, B and and Descartes uh, A are in fact uh, extensions of the things that go into the uh, Smoky and Stone Mountains. They right now look like they have a very similar texture. Roger, we copy. Hank, it sure looks like we can see Gator and Palmetto from here. It's almost straight down. Does it look like the map? Well, that stuff around the outside sure doesn't look like it did at high sun. Apollo 16, Houston, if you'll give us uh, accept, we'll uplink state vector and target load. You have it. And Apollo 16, Houston, I have your DOI pad, your map update, and landmark pad whenever you're ready. Okay, go ahead, ahead with the DOI pad. Huh? Roger. DOI, SPS, G and N. 41441 plus 187 minus zero seven one zero seven eight three three four four three niner now eighty one minus zero two zero five three all zips minus zero zero four five five Zero 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 two seven four zero 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 five eight five plus zero zero one zero three zero two one zero three zero two four Point two zero two zero three eight sextant star two 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 zero four eight two one seven rest of the pads in a set stars Sirius and Rigel one Three one zero seven one zero one four four jets fifteen seconds end of pad okay copy uh, DOI SPS GNN four one four four one plus one eight seven minus zero seven one zero seven eight three three four four three nine -er. Minus zero two zero five three plus uh, all balls minus zero zero four five five zero 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 two seven four zero 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 five eight five plus one zero zero one zero three zero two one zero three zero two four point two zero two zero three eight two 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 zero four eight two one seven. Rest of pad is in A. Sirius and Rigel. One three one zero seven one zero one four four jet fifteen seconds. Good read back, Charlie. I have your map update rev three whenever you're ready, Charlie, of seventy nine oh five in the flight plan. All right, why don't you give me the map update and the uh, landmark uh, pad? All righty. Map update. LOS seven eight two three one seven seven eight four eight zero nine seven niner one zero two five landmark pad is T horizon 
seven nine er three four one one seven nine er three six two two Roger, copy uh, map update of zero seven eight two three one seven zero seven eight four eight zero nine zero seven nine or one zero two five. Uh landmark tracking is seven nine or three four one one seven nine or three six two two. Good read back. Uh sixteen, the computer is yours, and I have your T E I five pad for the updates book. Hey, Hank, uh, before we do that, uh, looking at the change to the flight plan here, we've got to uh, load the verb 48 to put in the proper DAP and then just start 509 and then go to the uh, P-52. Uh, can we go ahead and stop the maneuver now and uh, will this attitude clear enough things that we can get a P-52 in here? Stand by. I'm sorry, I didn't copy that. Roger, stand by a minute, Ken, and I'll have FAO check. Thank you. I was worried about getting into the same problem we get into after uh, undocking tomorrow, where it might take a special angle. Roger, I understand. Follow 16, Houston, the FAO says this is a good attitude. 16 Houston, are, are you ready for the TEI 5 pad yet? Right, go ahead. Okay, pad follows. TEI 5 SPS GNN 39er 838 plus 061 plus 119er. Zero eight four three one four one three six nine eighty one plus three five two five two plus one two four seven three minus zero zero eight six eight one Eight two zero five six zero two two. The rest is in a set stars. Sirius Rigel. One three one zero seven one zero one four. Two jets. Seventeen seconds. Other, one, burn, undocked, two, assumes DOI, three, land in sight rest map. Right, uh, TEI 5, SPS slash JNN, 39er 838, plus 061, plus 119er, 0843141336. Plus three five two five two plus one two four seven three minus zero zero eight six eight one eight two zero five six zero two two. Rest of the pad is in A. Sirius and Rigel one three one zero seven one zero one four two jet seventeen seconds. Other one is burn undocked. Two assumes DOI. Three landing site rest land. Good read back, Charlie. This is Apollo Control at 77 hours, 54 minutes. Uh, during the last few minutes, uh, among the sets of numbers passed up to the crew by Capcom Hank Hartsfield were those that they'll use in performing the descent orbit insertion maneuver. And uh, that burn is to uh, occur at 78 hours, 33 minutes, uh, 44 seconds. The... Uh, uh, maneuver will be performed using the spacecraft service propulsion system engine. Uh, it will be a uh, primarily retrograde burn, uh, re resulting in uh, slowing the spacecraft by about 
5.8 feet per second or about 136 miles an hour. And as a result of that, we expect the orbit uh, uh, to be changed to a 58.5 by 10.3 nautical miles. Now, this is the orbit uh, from which the spacecraft will uh, begin the powered descent to the lunar surface on the 13th revolution. Houston, do you want to take a look at our rotated vector in P-40 before we start our maneuver? Roger, stand by. Your P-30 look good, Ken. Okay, uh, the question was, do you want to take a look at the rotated vector in P-40 before we start our maneuver, or can we go ahead and start the maneuver? Houston, did you miss the question? Negative, but we're having trouble finding an answer. Okay. 16 Houston, go ahead and call P-40 and then maneuver. Okay, uh, you got enough look now? He's looking at it now, Ken. You got a good vector, Ken, go ahead. This is Apollo Control at 78 hours, 2 minutes. At the present time, the Apollo 16 crew is in the process of uh, putting the spacecraft in its proper attitude for the descent orbit insertion maneuver. Uh, that burn is to be performed in 31 minutes, 30 seconds, uh, with the spacecraft uh, out of radio contact on the back side of the moon. Uh, we have about 21 minutes remaining before we lose radio contact. And in that amount of time, uh, we'll be... Uh, monitoring spacecraft systems, uh, the flight dynamics officer will be taking a last look at all of the numbers passed up to the crew uh, to assure that uh, the burn is the uh, precise maneuver that we want to perform. Uh, based on the numbers provided and uh, which are uh, entered in the computer uh, on board, uh, that burn will be uh, 24.2 seconds in duration and is targeted to give us an orbit of 58.5 by 10.3 uh, nautical miles. Uh, the current orbit is 169.9 by 58.1. 16, give us Omni Delta. Okay, you got it. Roger. This is Apollo Control. Uh, flight Director Pete Frank has just gone around the room pulling each of the flight controllers here, uh, getting a status for the descent orbit insertion maneuver. All the lights came up green. Everyone says we're go. And we'll be passing that go up to the crew uh, shortly. Apollo 16, Houston. Everything looks good down here. You've got a go for DOI. And the monitoring limits in the flight plan are good. Okay. This is Apollo Control. We're coming up now on nine minutes until loss of contact with Apollo 16. Uh, about 19 and a half minutes away from the time the crew will be performing the descent orbit insertion maneuver. Uh, this maneuver, of course, uh, performed behind the moon. We'll be out of radio contact, and we'll get our first look at the uh, results of that maneuver when they come back around on the other side of the moon uh, on their third revolution. Uh, this burn is a, a very critical maneuver which must be uh, performed with very precise, within very precise limits and particularly in the shutdown which the uh, computer will uh, signal. Uh, an overburn of slightly more than one second uh, would place the spacecraft on a trajectory which would impact the moon if it were not corrected. Uh, the normal procedure that the crew would follow uh, in the event that they do get an overburn is to take out the overburn by using the reaction control system thrusters. Uh, we'll get about 10 minutes of tracking uh, as they come around the front side of the moon on the third revolution. And based on this uh, information, we'll give them a go, no go uh, to stay in the uh, trajectory resulting from the descent orbit insertion maneuver. Uh, if we don't like the looks of the trajectory based on ground tracking, uh, they'll be told to perform the bailout burn. Uh, that maneuver is scheduled at 79 hours, 22 minutes, 8 seconds in the flight plan, if it is required. 
and would uh, uh, place the spacecraft in a safe 62 by 62.6 uh, by 5.3 uh, nautical mile orbit. Uh, again, this is a contingency procedure only and would be would be used only if for some reason the descent orbit insertion maneuver was not as planned and the spacecraft uh, was determined to be in an unsafe orbit. The guidance officer has just reported that the crew has switched to program 40, uh, the program uh, that they'll use prior to performing the descent orbit insertion maneuver. And everything continues to progress very smoothly. Roger, John. Okay, Houston, we're going to do the Gimbal Drive Tech. Roger, we're watching. Okay, the gimbals are trimmed. Roger, copy. And 509 is killed. Roger. Sixteen Houston, we're about two minutes from LOS. Roger, two minutes from LOS. About twelve, twelve from the burn. Roger. This is Apollo Control. We've now had loss of signal with Apollo 16. We'll be reacquiring the spacecraft in about uh, 45 minutes uh, with a good maneuver. We would expect that acquisition time to be 79 hours, 10 minutes, 25 seconds. Uh, without the burn, uh, we would be reacquiring about three and a half minutes uh, prior to that, or at 79 hours, 6 minutes, 46 seconds. As Apollo 16 went around the corner of the moon, uh, everything looked good for the maneuver. Uh, the spacecraft was in an orbit of 169.4 by 58.1 uh, nautical miles, and the last velocity reading we got was 5,368 feet per second. We're now about 9 minutes, uh, 17 seconds away from the scheduled uh, time that the crew will be performing descent orbit insertion. At 78 hours, 25 minutes, this is Apollo Control, Houston. This is Apollo Control at 79 hours, 6 minutes. Uh, we're about 4.5 minutes away from the expected uh, time of reacquiring Apollo 16 on its third revolution of the moon at uh, which time they should have lowered their orbit uh, to about 10 by 58 nautical miles. Uh, if, however, for some reason they did not perform that maneuver, uh, we would be uh, reacquiring uh, in about 30 seconds. The service propulsion system engine on this per particular spacecraft is consuming about uh, 66 pounds of propellant per second of burn uh, based on that uh, when next we see Apollo 16, they should be about uh, 1,600 pounds lighter and uh, traveling about 136 miles an hour slower. The uh, descent orbit insertion maneuver, uh, which was targeted to uh, occur at the ground elapsed time of 78 hours, 33 minutes, 44 seconds, uh, was to have... Uh, been a 24.2 second burn of the service propulsion system engine and this would produce a, a total velocity change of 210.3 feet per second most of which would be uh, retrograde giving us the desired orbit of 58.5 by 10.3 nautical miles and we've passed the uh, time of acquisition uh, had they not performed the burn, all continues to be quiet. Uh, we're now three minutes away from the uh, expected time of acquisition with a good descent orbit insertion maneuver. 
This is Apollo Control. We should be coming up on uh, acquisition of signal now. And network reports we have AOS. Okay, Houston, uh, nominal burn. First first DOI burn we ever had that was nominal. Roger. At that least uh, in our training. Okay, we're standby for your burn report. Okay, uh, Henry, it feels like if we had, uh, we're clipping the tops of the trees off here, what it looks like. Uh, we got a uh, burn report of a uh, Delta take zero. Burn time we got was 24.4 plus 2106. 2106 uh, uh, VGX, trim attitude 001, 272003. Though we did not trim, the residuals were plus 0.8, plus 0, plus 0.1, minus 2.3 Delta VC, fuel 337, ox 346. Roger 16, unbalanced. Okay, it jumped up to 200 uh, increase. Roger, copy. It never really stabilized, though, Hank. Okay. And a verb 82, last look, thought we were a 10.9 parity. Roger, copy, 10.9. But I don't think it really knows. But the misfit really knows. Uh, that last comment was from John Young. Uh, earlier we heard from Charlie Duke reporting uh, a nearly perfect descent orbit insertion uh, maneuver. Uh, Young reported that their onboard reading showed that they had uh, uh, an Apolloon of, uh, or rather a paraloon of 10.9 nautical miles. The uh, targeted was 10.3, uh, but again, that's an onboard reading, and we'll be uh, tracking and uh, getting a uh, reading here on the ground. Houston 16, it appeared to us that we got an auto shutdown. Roger, Charlie, copy, auto shutdown. You got any preliminary data, Houston? Uh, Roger, John, the Doppler says stay. We're waiting on the shore dock. Okay. Thank you. John Young's question is uh, in reference to a stay, no stay, that we'll be passing up from the control center here uh, in the event that uh, tracking data, and we'll get about two minutes of it on which the flight dynamics officer will make his calculations, in the event uh, tracking data uh, showed that we did not get the desired orbit and uh, uh, we're in an unsafe orbit. Uh, the crew has a maneuver on board that they would perform to raise their orbit to a satisfactory level. Uh, this is a so-called bailout burn, uh, which would be performed at 79 hours, 22 minutes, 8 seconds, uh, or about uh, 6 minutes from now. now. All indications preliminarily are that uh, everything is good. Now, assuming that maneuver went as planned, and uh, the orbit is as we would expect. Apollo 16 should be at an altitude of about 19 uh, nautical miles above the lunar surface, accounting for uh, Charlie Duke's earlier comment that it appeared they were right down among the treetops. Apollo 16, Houston, you're good on the short arc. You have a stay, and we show you 59 by 10.7. Roger, 59 by 10.7. Thank you, sir. 16 Houston, give you, could you give us auto on the high gain? Roger, have it. Henry, if you remember that little, uh, real bright crater on the northern rim of Ship Legan that Stu and Farouk were talking about the other day, we, we happened to see it, uh, right up close to us as we came by in this orbit. And we got a couple of things for you on it, and, uh, that's, that really is an unusual little guy. It's really beautiful. Roger, copy. Probably get carried away with all this, but uh, we've, we've done all kinds of things.
thinking to see back here. It'd really be nice to fly that kind of an orbit down low. Roger. And uh, we're pitching down to our landmark track attitude, and this is my first chance to point the sextant at the surface. And the sextant is just as clear as a bell. It's beautiful. You can pick out little bitty features. They're just, they're just as clear. There's no fuzziness. And the telescope's the same way. Hey, that's great. We ought to be able to get some good use out of that. This is Apollo Control. The uh, landmark tracking Ken Mattingly is referring to is a procedure used on board the spacecraft uh, to determine uh, their orbit. It's also a procedure that will be used uh, uh, by Mattingly from lunar orbit uh, to track the spacecraft on the surface of the moon, hopefully, and uh, allow uh, scientists on the ground to compute a uh, precise uh, location uh, for the landing site for the touchdown point of the lunar module. We now show Apollo 16 at uh, an altitude of 13.8 nautical miles, continuing to drop down towards Paracynthian. And uh, the preliminary tracking data the flight dynamics officer uh, reported shows uh, an orbit of 59 by 10.7. Uh, we expect that that uh, orbit will be refined somewhat as we get additional tracking. That's based on the uh, first look at the tracking data. Uh, but is, is uh, very close to the a desired orbit of uh, 58.5 by 10.3 nautical miles. Out to the uh, my side, out one to five, uh, was one crater here that uh, you could see in one section of it. It looked like some outcrop uh, two thirds of the way up the crater wall, and uh, some big blocks that uh, rolled down the uh, into the crater floor, and you could see the bowler tracks all the way down. Roger, copy. Can you locate that one? Uh, wait a minute. No, I'm pretty lost right now. Let me see if I can figure it out. Ken, while you're maneuvering there, we'd like to ask you uh, what value did you put you put in your EMS and what uh, did you get on your EMS check? Uh, Houston 16 at uh, Crater Head, I think, was in a, in a series uh, around uh, McLaurin, maybe a little bit further uh, west than that. Roger, copy. Uh, Hank, uh, coming across the bar here, uh, reminds you of uh, your pedostatic system, Cal's at uh, Edwards. Roger. You're, you're really down low screaming across, huh? 16, Houston, did you copy the question I had about the EMS uh, Delta V? Roger, copy. And looking on up into the Gutenberg uh, reel, you can see it cross uh, uh, one crater, just climbed right across the crater wall. Roger. And that's Gutenberg C. Yeah. That's Gutenberg C, Hank, and uh, you can see the wall is down dropped uh, into the reel. Roger, copy. How do you read, Charlie? I'm bringing you bye-bye. Okay, a little earlier I asked a question about the EMS Delta V. Did you copy that? Negative, we did not. Okay. Uh, it, it read minus 2.3. Roger, we had a question here as to how the EMS Delta V check came out and uh, which value uh, you loaded into the Delta V counter. Uh, 
Got that by. Can I call you in a second on that, Hank? Sure thing. It was like one point. It was like one point eight at shutdown because of the drift in the EMS, and I did a check, and it came out to be normal, and the bias was the same. I put in the delta VT. The same thing uh, we've used before because it looked to me like the bias was in uh, less than a uh, half a foot per second. Roger, copy. We were a little confused here because uh, the the value that you had at the end there was somewhere in between what we thought it ought to be, if you depending on which setting you put in the delta V counter. Roger. It was about 1.6 uh, or something like that. It shut down. I, I'll have to look back at the flight plan. Okay, uh, Houston, uh, the uh, walls, the north wall of Capella has uh, striations that are dipping uh, eastward about, uh, oh, uh, 60 degrees or so all the way across the north face. Roger, copy, Charlie. Okay, and also is the door the same thing? Roger. J2 should be on horizon now, Ken. All right, so we got the it's right on the horizon. Still haven't picked up the target yet. Uh, looks like it's tracking just about right. I have the Opolis, uh going out of the field of view now. Ken, you're coming up on about 30 seconds to TCA. He has the target, Houston. Roger. Big old hill downstream of where you're going. Guess who's sneaking in marks on Gator Crater right now? I wonder who. Gator Crater is about uh, 700 yards across one of the craters uh, at the Descartes landing site, Ken Mattingly uh, obviously taking landmark sightings on that crater at the present time as Apollo 16 passes directly over the landing site. Now that's what I call OJT right there. How'd the landing site look through the sextant? You have to do that with a telescope, hey? Eh? Oh, Roger. I think that's the best uh, high-speed pass I've ever made. Roger. Sixteen Houston, I have your map and pan camera photo pads for eighty thirty-five. Whenever you're ready. Okay, Henry, go ahead. Roger. T. Stark. Zero eight zero three eight. Zero one. T stop. Zero eight zero four six zero four. And the same pad is good for the pan camera. Okay, T start zero eight zero three eight zero one. T stop zero eight zero four six zero four. Good uh, rebound. Copy the same pad for both cameras. 16 Houston, we'd like you to go on and get in the Simbay attitude so we can get a DSE dump. Welcome. Hey, uh, Hank, you want me to go ahead and do this on a single jet authority or use couples to go to the attitude? Stand by. Uh, Ken, why don't you go ahead and go couple, then we can go single jet. Okay, sounds like a good plan. Sixteen on the Charlie. Hank, uh, would you check on one thing for me? Uh, would you find out uh, if this uh, method I've been using for reading out the maneuver times, verb four, noun one, is in any way affected by or affects the use of program five zero nine? I uh, will do, Ken. Thank you, sir. And uh, I got a couple of minutes here if you'd like to go over some of those questions you had before now. I, I wasn't paying much attention. 
Uh, stand by, Ken. I, I think they got your answer while I go and satisfied them, but I'll make sure. Okay. I wasn't paying a lot of attention. I was trying to pick up that landmark. Uh, do you have any comments on the landmark, Dragon? Did it all go smoothly? Well, except for the fact that those optics are perfect. <laughs> That's really neat. Uh, the target area did not look as I anticipated. Um, it's, uh, I think it's a function of the low sun angle, but it looked to me like there were uh, far more uh, rims around the craters than, uh, than what the impression I had from looking at things on the, on the models. And I did not pick up uh, north or south ray. They still were in the shadows. So uh, I guess it's possible that I could have been on the wrong crater, but uh, it sure looked to me like I must have been on Gator. Roger, copy. It's still, uh, still a problem in scaling when you look at something like that until you're sure that you have the right feel for it. But uh, I think it's pretty obvious, and I think picking it up tomorrow will be uh, relatively easy. 16, Houston, could you bring up the high gang? Pitch plus 35, y'all 290. Say again your yaw number. Roger, 29 or 0. And Ken, uh, there's no problem. Okay, and Hank, and we're about. Go ahead, Hank. Roger, they say there's no problem in uh, calculating maneuver completion time and and it does not interfere with 509. Okay, thank you. I've been avoiding using that. All right, we're about ready to uh, go through our solar monitor and tie down release. Uh, you folks ready for us to do that? Roger, we're ready to go, Ken. Okay. Okay, Houston, we uh, released the tie downs and the door and uh, heard just a very tiny little sound on each of those activities. Roger, we copy, Ken. Hank, another piece of uh, questionable data that we've collected today is uh, when our low pass on the back side there, we got our color wheel out. And uh, we have two votes for number 17 and one vote for number 13. So Roger, copy. And that's over on the back side, just uh, past uh, Shepligan. And uh, number 17 really isn't quite right. It's just the closest thing we had. And the uh, same comment applies to number 13. Well, I was going to say 13 was right on. You'll never time. guess who voted for 13. The grits have affected his vision. That's probably what it is, John. Right. Hey, Hank, ask to who he believes. Will do. Okay, Hank, we have the Simba jet configuration, and I'm going to start deploying the equipment. Roger, copy. Ken, you want to keep us uh, posted on what you're doing there with the switches? Okay, I got the uh, mapping camera door open and the alpha cover door open and the mapping camera is going out. And we've just gone through one minute of extent time and I'm timing the first one. Roger, copy. I'll do the gamma ray and aspect booms uh, sequentially afterwards so I can pay attention to the times. Okay, and I've got uh, gray on the mapping camera extend and that was at uh, one minute and 20 seconds. Roger, copy. Okay, can you read me on box, Henry? Uh, Roger. Okay, that's the way we'll operate. I'm going to the gamma ray deploy at this time. I'm going to hold it for barber pole plus two seconds and off. Going to deploy. Deploy. Barber pole now. One, two, off. And it's gray. Gamma Ray is coming to retract. Mark, barber pole. And it's gray. Okay, going to the mass spectrometer. 
deploy. Fark, barber pole. One, two, off. Mass spec to retract. Fark, barber pole. Off. Okay, they're both in the retract position and everything looks normal. The X-ray is coming on. Fark. I've completed the gamma ray and mass spec boom deployment and retraction, and I'm ready to go ahead with the mass spec deploy, if that's okay with you. Roger, go ahead. Hey, it's uh, deploy on the mass spec, and I'm timing it. Give us auto on the high gain 16. Five seconds to stop. Okay, it's off on the mass spectrometer. Yeah, model. Okay, Hank, you've got the mass spec out to 8.4 feet. Roger, looks good down here. Laser altimeter is coming on. Mark. And can I go ahead and put the mass spec experiment on without waiting the three or four minutes? Stand by. Roger, go ahead. Okay. Mass spectrometer experiment is coming on. Mark. The ion source is going to stand by. Mark it. Can you tell how the laser is doing yet, Hank? Stand by, Kim. We'll take a look. Laser looks good, Ken. Outstanding. This is Apollo Control at 80 hours, 12 minutes. The guidance and control officer uh, reports that uh, from looking at the uh, replay of data from that descent orbit insertion maneuver, uh, performed at the end of the second revolution. Uh, he reports that the engine appeared to perform normally in every respect, and we're co currently showing Apollo 16 in an orbit uh, 58.6 nautical miles by 9.9, uh, .9. and uh, we expect that that will uh, continue to be refined somewhat. Ken Mattingly has uh, completed a series of exercises that uh, uh, deploy certain of the experiments in the uh, service module, scientific instrument module bay, the SIM bay experiments, uh, the gamma ray and uh, gamma ray spectrometer and mass spectrometer on 25 foot and uh, 24 foot booms uh, respectively uh, were extended to their full out position and then retracted uh, to check the operation. Uh, Mattingly then uh, extended the uh, mass spectrometer uh, to about a third of its length and uh, turned it on. It's uh, about 8.4 feet out from the side of the service module now on, on its uh, retractable boom and also turned on the laser altimeter. The mass spectrometer is designed to gather uh, information on the uh, nature and composition of the lunar atmosphere also to de detect uh, contaminants in that atmosphere, uh, such things as uh, the volatile products. Uh. Two minutes from LOS. All ready. See you in a little while. Roger. The mass spectrometer detects such things as the volatile uh, products given off uh, by volcanoes, should uh, any of those uh, happen to be active. Uh, around this time. Uh, we'll also uh, detect water vapor should uh, that exist in the lunar atmosphere. The other experiment activated by uh, Mattingly was the laser altimeter. Uh, you heard him ask uh, how that was performing. The report from the orbital science officer here was that it uh, appeared to be functioning normally. Uh, this device uh, measures the spacecraft altitude above the lunar surface and is correlated with uh, panoramic camera photographs obtained of the lunar surface. Uh, putting these two 
bits of information together, the photo and the laser altimeter data, it's possible to determine within about six feet the elevation of lunar surface features. We're now about uh, 45 seconds from uh, losing radio contact with Apollo 16 as the spacecraft passes behind the moon on its third revolution. Uh, we'll be reacquiring, uh, reestablishing radio contact at the beginning of the fourth revolution in about 45 minutes. Uh, Houston, 16, you read? Roger. Okay, Hank, uh, I'm up with the uh, biomed. Uh, take a quick look at it. Looks good. Okay, uh, since we're going to put on our LCGs tonight, uh, I don't put on the... Uh This is Apollo Control at 81 hours, 4 minutes. Uh, we're standing by now to regain radio contact with Apollo 16, uh, now in its fourth revolution of the moon. Now, this will be the last uh, frontside pass uh, prior to the time the crew begins their scheduled 9-hour rest period. And should be a relatively uh, quiet period. And the flight dynamics officer has just reported uh, that their uh, latest tracking shows the spacecraft to be in an orbit of 58.6 by 10.6 nautical miles. As a result of that uh, descent orbit insertion maneuver, and we're about uh, 10 seconds now from uh, regaining radio contact. Uh, we've had acquisition of signal. Apollo 16, Houston. Apollo 16, Houston, how you ready? You're bye bye, Hank. Roger. Uh, our data down here we worked on during the backside shows you're in 58.8 by 10.6. Roger, copy. You want to tell us about it? Uh, stand by. Yeah, it was when Ken was uh, uh, messing around with the sim bay, and uh, he'll uh, fill you in. Okay. Yeah, we got a little behind on the sequence already, I think. But as soon as I turned the, uh, had the mapping camera on, uh, and it worked fine, I turned the uh, pan camera on. And uh, as soon as I went to operate on the pan camera, we got a main B undervolt. So uh, I turned it back to standby and left it there. Uh, Charlie said he saw about 25 volts on main B. And uh, concluded I'd wait and let you take a look at it. And uh, then we got another main B undervolt uh, some five minutes or so later. And it, again, was a momentary. By the time we looked at it, it all looked uh, pretty normal. The only, uh, we checked the fuel cell regulator pressures, they look good, and uh, really don't uh, have any idea what might have caused it. Yeah, all the things we could check look okay. Uh, Hank, uh, we got, it might not even be a small anomaly, but fuel cell 3, the uh, H2 flow's uh, running a little bit higher than the uh, O2 flow, 
but the regulated pressure looks fine to me. But the other two fuel cells, H2 and O2, match. Roger, we copy, Charlie. My guess is when you dump the DSC, the whole story would be right on there, probably. Okay, Chad, done. When you get the DSC translated, it'll probably tell you what happened. Roger, we copy. I think you really can see both the mass spec and the gamma ray booms deployed. Roger, I understand you can see them both. That's firm. Looks like a couple of feet of the boom is about all you can see. You really got us puzzled with this uh, undervolt now because the pan camera runs off the main A. Yeah, we noticed the same thing. Uh, it, you know, it may not be rational, but it just seemed like that was the. I touched one switch and it got a main undervolt, so I took it back off again. Decided to let you think about it before yeah. I asked anymore. Possible that it doesn't have any connection. Roger. I still have the power on it, uh, Hank. Uh, I've got it in standby and power on. Roger, copy. And Ken, uh, I'd like to verify, is your non-essential bus on main A or main B? That's main A. Roger. And uh, Hank, uh, last night we... Uh, uh, I think we got verification that we could wear the uh, LCGs uh, to bed tonight and uh, be all ready to go for in the morning. That is affirmative. Okay. Anybody thought any more about uh, my suit? Well, we've thought about it and smoked it over, and uh, we kind of think maybe we ought to do nothing unless you have some real bad trouble tomorrow. Like if we can't get it zipped. Okay, uh, can I use my pliers on it to pull the zipper closed? Houston. Houston 16, do you read over? Roger, reading you 5x5, five five, John, go ahead. Okay, if I have trouble closing it, can I use my pliers to get a better grip on it to pull it closed? Because uh, it took me the better part of 20 minutes uh, of the day to do it, and it usually takes about two. There's a place on there in the small of Charlie's back where that thing is just separated too far apart on the restraint zipper for me to pull it closed easily. When he gets on the LCG, the FCS, and the uh, UCD bulk in there, the suit is going to be farther apart than it was yesterday. John, we talked to Dave about that, and uh, he said the big problem is you can't arch your back in zero G as well. He had he had a lot of trouble too, but on the on the moon and one six G, he had no problem at all because the gravity helped him arch his back. Uh, uh, does that sound like the problem? You just couldn't get Arch back there far enough to do it? Uh, you got me there. He looked like he was arched as much as he usually is. But you're saying if I can't do it in in uh, in uh, zero G, we going down the moon and try it in uh, one six G? Well, that sounds pretty good, John. Uh, we we did look at a backup procedure here, but it's a a long looks like a long thing that involves using a needle and pulling things together like you're sewing. Okay, uh, Hank. Uh, I think to give us uh, every benefit of the doubt uh, uh, that I will not. Uh, I don't plan to wear the. Uh, uh, the FCS probably uh, uh, tomorrow, and I'll just use the uh, LCG and the uh, UCD. Roger, 
Roger, uh, understand, and could you give us auto on a high gain? There you go. Uh, Hank, uh, also, uh, we'd like to get permission to fill the drink bags tonight to save a few minutes also, if uh, you think that's going to be all right. Roger that. Uh, go ahead and do that, Charlie. All right. Ken, we can't find any connection between the pan camera and main bus A, and we were wonder or main bus B, and we were wondering if uh, uh, when you got the second momentary one uh, under volt, were you moving any switches at that time? That's negative. They were both uh, momentary uh, main bus intervals. Roger, the, the the first one was a momentary also? I, yeah, it could be, or it could be that the sensor is triggering at the wrong level. It could be that the sensor shifted up to something that looks reasonable. Uh, I wouldn't object to, we still got the pan camera power on, I wouldn't object to hit it to operate for a second. And back off, go ahead and use a couple of frames just to let you watch it. Stand by, Ken. Uh, Houston, uh, 16. Go ahead. He comes satisfied with his black all of app out. Uh, we got all scale high here. And, uh... Stand by a minute, Charlie. 16, Houston, uh, he come advises that's the top of the scale that, uh, you're still okay. You should now monitor rat out. Okay, red out is uh, 75. Roger. 16 Houston, uh, talk with the suit people and they don't want you using the pliers on the uh, shippers. I just used it to better, get a better grip with, not to pull a zipper, just to pull with. Uh, the concern is over side loads, John. They're afraid for to use the pliers. Okay. This is Apollo Control at 81 hours, 30 minutes. Uh, we'd like to talk to you a minute about this uh, docking latch, if you're free. Okay, we got a real long procedure here. I don't think you need to copy it all down. Uh, let me just read it through to you once and uh, kind of maybe discuss it as we go. Uh, what we want to do is kind of get a look at the thing uh, tomorrow and see what the condition of it is. After you disconnect the limb umbilical, we want, would like for you to open the orange limb umbilical connector cover and inspect the roller pole. Uh, the roller pawl, we hope, is engaged in the detent, but we'd like to find out if it's in the detent or is it free or sticking up, and you can do that by looking in the side of the latch after you remove that umbilical connector cover. Or, is any question on that? Yeah, I'm not sure I know what you're looking for. Okay, if, when you look in the side there, uh, I'm not at all sure what the roller pawl is. Okay, uh, the roller pawl is on the far left side of the latch, behind and above the auxiliary release button, and it can be identified by the roller on the tip of the pawl. The pawl is just a little arm that sticks out, and it's got a little roller right on the end of it that rides on the cam that has these detents in it. Okay. You want to do this before we unlock it? Uh, that's affirmative. And uh, it best be done tomorrow after, uh, b before you uh, get your helmet and gloves on, of course. Just take a look at it while, perhaps while they're bringing the limb up. And if you, if you find, after we get the condition of that, if the roller's down in the detent like we suspect it is, uh, you, when you remove the yellow probe umbilical cover on the right side of the latch, we'd like you to look in the right side in there and 
at the bungee bell crank mechanism and see if there's any foreign object damage or anything wedged up in there. When you say remove the cover, you mean physically remove it from the spacecraft or just open it up and look underneath? Just open it up and uh, look under there, Ken. And this is mainly, these two steps are just uh, an inspection. We just like to verify the condition of the, the roller paw and uh, also the uh, bell crank mechanism on the other side. It has nothing to do with the latch, but at least give us an idea of what's wrong inside, if there is anything. Uh, it's not going to help you in any way prepare for unlocking it. To, to unlock it, after you've uh, uh, looked at these two things, we'd like to know if the uh, latch handle requires force to cock the latch on the first stroke and the second stroke if required. In other words, if the handle comes away real easy, as you recall, then the thing is already cocked. Uh, more than likely, it's going to take some force, and uh, we'd like to verify how this works. And it should require force, pull it down, and then we want to see that the hook comes out to inboard approximately 16 degrees. If the hook doesn't come out, then all you got to do is pull down on the handle to the full cock position and hold it and then just reach up and grab the hook and pull it inboard about 16 degrees and the hook should stay there. And then you just proceed with normal undocking. Okay, so the kind of things you want me to look for are information only. Is that affirmative? Right. Uh, it would help the guys down here to try to understand uh, what, what really happened to the latch. We kind of suspect it only got one cock. But, uh, if, if you look in there and look for the roller pawl on the left side and look at the bell crank on the right side, at least that will tell us there's nothing jamming it and that the roller pawl is in the right direction, right place. Operationally, though, to prepare for undocking, what it really amounts to, you just use a normal procedure. You pull the, pull the latch handle down and cock it if necessary, and if the, if the hook doesn't come back, just hold the latch handle all the way down to the full cock position and pull the, pull the hook back. Okay. I just wanted to keep in mind what it was I needed if the time gets crowded. Roger. The only thing is, just, if there's any question on cocking, the only thing you got to do there is just pull it down and get the hook out of the way. Do you have any questions on any of that? Uh, Hank, uh, we just came over. Not, not right now. Uh, maybe when I get in and look at it, I'll call and ask you for some clarification or something tomorrow, but I think I know what you mean. Okay. Uh, Hank, as uh, we came up uh, towards the landing site, uh, in that terrain, the general terrain to the... Uh, East of it uh, appears to me uh, uh, to be a, a frothy, uh, vesicular looking uh, type of terrain, R real craggy looking uh, at this scale. Over. Roger, we copy, Charlie. I'd say that was the, the Descartes, uh, uh, has that appearance to it to me. Roger. And do you have this uh, limb gap uh, load for us and uh, TEI? Roger, we're working on those pads now. Charlie, we'd like to get a bat B charge going. Okay, bat B charge going on. Bat B is charging. 16 Houston, I have your TEI 1219 block data. Okay, stand by. Okay, go ahead. Okay, TEI 12, SPS, GNN. Three. 
for DOI, I won't repeat unless you want. Ullage, two jets, 17 seconds. Other remarks? Burn, undock. Assumes no circ. Longitude moon at TIG, minus 171.47. Land in sight, rest map. Right, uh, TEI 12, SPS GNN, 39er 817, plus 061, plus 119er, 097, 45, 5309 plus 31632, plus 10403, minus 02346-181080020, NA. Cirrus and Rigel, and uh, information the same as DOI, two jets, 17 seconds. Burn undocked, assumes no cert. Longitude of moon at TIG, minus 171.47. Landing site rest man. Good read back, and are you ready for TEI 19? You speak. Roger, TEI 19er. SPS, GNN. Three niner four four five plus zero six one plus one one five one 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 three one four niner eight one plus two niner zero niner four plus zero seven eight five three minus zero two two four zero one eight one one zero 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 one seven set stars same as DOI two jets seventeen seconds other burn undocked Assumes circ Lambda Moon at TIG minus one six zero zero niner in the path. If you'll give us accept, we're ready to uplink. All right, you have it. And uh, read back uh, TEI 19, SPS GNN, 39 or 445, plus 061, plus 115, 111, 311, 419, 894, plus 297, 853, minus 02240, 181, 100, 017. Sirius and Rigel, two jets, 17 seconds. Burn undock, assume CERC, lambda at uh, TIG, uh, that was one six zero zero nine. -er. Roger. Henry, can I assume that uh, the mission timer is uh, in sufficient sync and that we don't need to do any updates there and that the rest mat is good as is? That's affirmative. Thank you, sir. Have you got
got the limb uh, dap uh, stuff, uh, Hank. Roger, we got it, and uh, we're up Lincoln now, and we're also loading your EMP 509, and I have your DAP if you're ready to copy. Go ahead. Correction on that, it's not 509, it's a jet monitor. Okay, limb DAP. Limb weight, 36673. CSM weight, 39er, 329er. Checklist, dips, gimbal, trims are good. No trim required. Raj, uh, reading 36673, 39er, 329er, and the gimbals are uh, good as is. It's a good read back, Charlie. I have a change to your limb timeline book on page one. Uh, stand by. Is it the timeline or activation? A timeline book. It's a change to your undocking attitude, Charlie. It says timeline book. Okay, I just had to get it out. Go ahead, page one. Okay, change undocking attitude to zero two eight four zero six four. The reason for this is because of the docking right, index. Right, zero two eighty. Right, zero two eighty four zero six four. Roger, that's because of your docking index angle of minus three and a half degrees. Copy. And I have some flight plan changes for you. Apollo sixteen Houston, we'd like to verify the position of the O2 tank 50 watt heaters on panel 226. They're open. Roger, copy. They're open. Charlie, you ready to copy the flight plan changes? What kind of flight plan? Lim or CSM type? Uh, Roger, they're CSM. Uh, if you want to get them, can they're for the Mars activities? Okay, I'm ready. Okay, the first one is at 96.34. Go ahead. Okay, uh, there's a verb 48 there. Change R1 to read 10102. Okay, 10102 for verb 48, uh, R1 at 96.34. That's correct. At 96.39, write in load EMP 509, leave on through gimbal drive check for CERC. Okay, at uh, 39, load 509 and leave through CERC gimbal drive check. That's correct. The next change is at 97.15. Go. Delete the verb 48. Okay. Deleted the verb 48 at 97.15, and that's because we'd already said it. Affirmative? That's affirmative. And that also prevents you from uh, activating that uh, Saturn DAP. Okay, at 97.44, uh, right after, right prior to the verb 49 maneuver there, put in load DAP, verb 48, 10101, X1111.
Okay, you want to load uh, for 48-1-0-1-0-1 and X-1-1-1-1 after the CERC burn and ahead of the verb 49 maneuver. That's affirmative, and uh, Ken, the computer is yours, the e-memory program is loaded. All right, sir. Thank you. Okay, the next change is at 98.32. Prior to the comm check there, put load EMP 509. Go, Ethan. Okay, prior to comm check, load 509. Roger, and down about 98.44, after poo, Add, terminate EMP 509 after the P-24 is complete. Okay, I'll terminate 509 between PU and loading verb 48. Roger. The next change is at 100 hours, 32 minutes. Load EMP 509. Okay, at about 132, load 509. Roger, and about 143, terminate EMP 509 after P24 complete. Okay, we'll terminate 509 after P24. Okay, Ken, that's it on the flight plan changes. Uh, I hate to bring this up again, but they've got a change here for your SPS burn cue card. All right. What might that be? Well, we had this starting this thing 20 minutes early before so that we could help you uh, prior to LOS. Uh, and... Uh, we're convinced that you don't really need that much time, and what, what we think you ought to do is get the gimbal drive test started. You know, the main bus is on about eight minutes early rather than six minutes. So the change is to where we had you 40 minutes or minus 20 minutes is to change that to 52 and minus eight. Okay. Do I dare use my ink pen this time? I hope it's good for the rest of the bars now. If we change that to uh, 52 minutes and minus 8 minutes. Okay, that's no sweat. Thank you. Okay, and the next one will become uh, 41 minutes and minus, uh, correction, 53 minutes and minus 7. Okay, 53 and minus 7 and 52 and minus 8. Okay, now, earlier we had deleted that uh, uh, tape recorder high bit rate line there and added it back on the back page, and I guess now we need to, to, to move it back. Okay, would you settle for minus 8 so I can just leave it where it is? Roger, that's good enough. Uh, just do it there and delete it from the back, back side of the card. Okay, we'll do that. Hank, uh, are we going to end up with uh, temperatures that are low enough, or would you like for me to manually set this uh, temp in valve to a little lower temperature? Uh, are you talking about the oxidizer pressure, Ken? No, sir, the manual temp in and the glycol loop. Oh, that uh, Ecom advisors, that looks pretty good now. Okay, is it going to get too cold on the on the dark side? Stand by a minute. Uh, Ken, Ecom says that the present setting should keep you in good shape. Oh, 
tank, I guess I'd, I would like to run a, a cooler to get the cockpit a little cooler if that isn't going to cause any other problems. Stand by, man, Ken. Casper Houston, we'd like to get the pan camera turned off. Mm -hmm. Okay. You just want to take uh, turn the power off, huh? Roger, we were trying to look at a, run it, but uh, we've got pretty high loads on the spacecraft now, and uh, uh, we're getting close to LOS, and there's not going to be time enough to exercise it. Okay, we'll just turn it uh, off then. Okay, Hank, we've got the pan camera power off. Roger, Ken, and did you happen to notice the retract time on the mapping camera? Yes, sir, I meant to get that in. That was, I thought it was excessive. In fact, I thought it had maybe stuck. It was about three minutes. Roger, we copy. And, uh, Hank, I got some, uh, some film status to give you if you're ready for that. Stand by. Go ahead. Say again. I'm ready to copy, Ken. Okay. And magazine Victor, we're up to frame number eight. Sierra, Sierra, frame number one three. Tango, Tango, zero four. November, November, three six. Roger, copy. Victor eight, Sierra, Sierra, one three. Tango, Tango, zero four. November, November, three six. That's correct, sir. Sixteen Houston, uh, to more evenly distribute the, the electrical loads. When you get on the back side after LOS, we'd like you to take Telecom Group Two to AC One. Okay, Telecom Group Two to AC One. Roger, that's after LOS. And uh, in regard to the mixing valve, you can adjust that for an evap out temperature of 49 degrees and you ought to be okay. Okay, is that 49 degrees uh, the coldest temperature? Or, or just how did you? If you adjust it right now to an evap out any... Okay. Okay, right now for 49. Call 16 Houston, we'd like to get an E-Mod if we can. On the way. Roger. And 16 Houston, uh, uh, make sure you get the comm set up right in your uh, pre-sleep checklist here. Enco says they won't be able to command anything right. We'll have to wake you up next time. Uh, say again, Hank. Uh, Roger, they're admonishing me to tell you to be sure you follow the checklist on setting up the comm pre-sleep. Rog, we'll do that. Call uh, 16 Houston, we're about uh, two minutes from LS.
This is Apollo Control. Uh, we've lost radio contact now with the spacecraft as it uh, passes behind the moon on the fourth revolution. Uh, the crew is scheduled to begin a nine-hour rest period while on the backside of the moon, and uh, we would expect uh, to hear no further word from them uh, until the end of that rest period. Uh, during this uh, frontside pass on the fourth revolution, uh, there were uh, three major items covered. I'll try to run through those three and uh, summarize what uh, to us appeared to be the major points. On first uh, reacquiring contact, uh, John Young reported that uh, they had seen two main bus B undervolt uh, conditions. As he described it, these were transitory events uh, with the main bus B uh, voltage, dro voltage dropping uh, uh, briefly to the point where it triggered a mas master caution and warning alarm. Uh, normally, main bus B, which is one of two main buses supplying electrical power to the uh, equipment aboard the command and service module, uh, operates at about 27 to 28 volts under load. The uh, master caution and warning is set to trigger at uh, about 26.25 volts if the voltage drops to that level. And in replaying the uh, data tapes, uh, we saw the voltage drop to about 26.14 volts. The data tape replay, however, showed no uh, indication of a problem with any of the electrical equipment. Uh, one sometimes uh, suspects uh, momentary current overloads, a uh, heavy drain of current, which would then drag the voltage down. Uh, but there was no indication that any of the equipment was malfunctioning. Uh, the one thing that uh, the crew described that uh, appeared to be coincident uh, with the voltage uh, drop was the operation of the pan camera. Uh, however, simultaneous data on this camera when it was operating showed that the camera was functioning normally. Uh, at this point, after looking at all of the data and uh, considering the, the loads on both main bus A and main bus B, uh, one supposition is that uh, we had a coincident series of uh, events uh, which momentarily overloaded uh, main bus B, uh, such things as uh, heaters coming on simultaneously. At the same time, we had a, a heavy current drain for the SIM bay activities. Uh, if this is, in fact, the case, uh, it can easily be remedied by transferring uh, some of the uh, load to main bus A, a simple reconfiguration. And uh, that uh, appears to be the, uh, the most likely cause of the main bus uh, under voltages, in which case uh, we would have no, uh, no particular problem. Uh, one other thing that was discussed was the uh, suit problem. Uh, going back to the beginning of this one, uh, Charlie Duke reported last night on uh, uh, entering the lunar module suited, uh, getting suited up and getting into the lunar module, that uh, John Young had had some difficulty getting the suit zipped, the uh, restraint zipper, uh, closed across the back of the suit. This zipper uh, does not maintain the pressure of the suit, but uh, uh, is a load-carrying zipper that uh, holds all the layers together on the outside of the uh, pressure uh, pressure layers. Uh, and uh, Duke mentioned that uh, in order to minimize the problem of getting the suit zipped tomorrow, he would like to leave off the fecal containment system. Uh, in zipping the suit up the first time, both the fecal containment system uh, and the liquid cool garment were not worn. Uh, Duke's feeling was that uh, once these additional uh, items were added underneath the suit, it would increase the problem of closing that zipper. Uh, we gave him a go-ahead to leave the uh, fecal containment system off and uh, recommend that uh, uh, they make an attempt to get the suit zipped using their normal procedures. Uh, John Young suggested the possibility of using a pair of pliers that they carry on board to assist in it. Uh, the recommendation at this time is that that not be done. Uh, Dave Scott, who was by earlier in the evening, uh, discussed uh, with the flight controllers a, a similar problem that uh, they encountered, uh, although apparently not quite so severe, 
on Apollo 15, and uh, Dave's analysis of that situation was that in zero G, it's more difficult to arch one's back uh, without gravity to help. Uh, arching the back is a method that is used to uh, reduce the uh, the strain across this zipper so that it's easier to get it closed. And uh, it was suggested to Charlie that he make every effort to brace himself uh, and get the back arched in order to uh, make the job a little easier of getting that zipper closed. And uh, we do have a, a backup procedure that will be discussed uh, with the crew uh, to assist in closing that zipper. Uh, if the problem arises tomorrow when they're uh, preparing to get into the lunar module and uh, suiting up. Also, uh, uh, Capcom uh, Henry Hartsfield discussed uh, a procedure with Ken Mattingly for checking out the docking latches. Uh, one of the 12 docking latches uh, has apparently not uh, latched down firmly onto the uh, LEM tunnel uh, docking ring. Uh, this causes no uh, particular concern, but uh, there is some interest in determining why the latch did not close. Uh, Mattingly last night was asked to uh, uh, cycle a device that is connected with the uh, latch. Uh, this gave the flight controllers an indication that uh, the latch, which is cocked prior to docking, uh, was not fully cocked and therefore did not latch fully. Uh, there is also the possibility that the latch is broken. Uh, in order to determine which of these uh, is the case, uh, he was, Mattingly was given a uh, series of procedures to follow, uh, which we hope will provide some information and shed some light on whether the uh, latch simply was not fully cocked or whether it uh, uh, is broken or has, some, uh, has malfunctioned in some other way. Uh, this is primarily of concern for uh, future flights. It doesn't have a direct bearing on this uh, this flight. It's felt that uh, uh, the latch will in no way affect undocking. And uh, since only three of the 12 latches are required for a firm hard docking, uh, there's no particular concern that uh, it will in any way affect the docking either. As mentioned previously, we expect to see the crew asleep when uh, next we reacquire the spacecraft. That'll be in about uh, 40 minutes. And as uh, Apollo 16 went around the corner on the fourth revolution, uh, we showed it in an orbit of 58.7 by 10.4 nautical miles. At 82 hours, uh, 19 minutes into the flight of Apollo 16, this is Apollo Control Houston. This is Apollo Control at uh, 82 hours, 58 minutes. Uh, we're about uh, one minute away from regaining radio contact with Apollo 16, uh, the spacecraft now on its fifth revolution of the moon. And uh, we expect the crew is uh, in their sleep period at this time. Uh, they're scheduled to have a nine-hour uh, rest period uh, beginning about 30 minutes ago while they were on the back side of the moon. However, we will have the uh, uh, circuits up live in case they haven't begun their sleep period and have any uh, last-minute items to discuss with mission control before beginning the rest period. And network has just called out uh, AOS, acquisition of signal. And we see all of the data now uh, suddenly come alive on the uh, television displays here of the uh, telemetry data from the spacecraft. Uh, we won't plan to put in a call to the crew. Uh, however, we will, will be standing by uh, should we get a call from them.
And the uh, communications uh, engineer says that uh, the spacecraft appears to be configured for sleep. The high gain antenna is uh, in the proper position. Uh, the uh, voice subcarrier is turned off. So we'll uh, uh, presume that the crew has begun its, uh, its rest period. This is Apollo Control at 83 hours, 35 minutes. Uh, we now have uh, a little under 30 minutes of uh, acquisition time remaining before Apollo 16 goes around the corner on the fifth revolution of the moon and we lose radio contact. And it has remained uh, quiet. Uh, no uh, calls from the crew and uh, relatively little activity here in the control center, uh, primarily monitoring systems and... Uh, uh, preparing for tomorrow's activities. Uh, we're continuing to watch the uh, spacecraft orbit change gradually. Uh, we're now showing an apogee of 58.8 .8 nautical miles and uh, uh, perigee or paracynthian, more correctly, of 10.5 nautical miles. Now this crew rest period is scheduled to last for uh, about nine hours. And uh, the crew is, uh, is to be awakened at about uh, 91 hours, 30 minutes, uh, or about uh, eight hours from now. This is Apollo Control at uh, 84 hours, 3 minutes now into the flight of Apollo 16. And nearing the end of the fifth revolution around the moon, uh, we have about uh, 1 minute and 45 seconds before we lose radio contact with the spacecraft. Uh, we've heard nothing from the crew. Uh, they're in their uh, rest period. And uh, all spacecraft systems uh, appear to be functioning uh, properly at the present time. Uh, we show Apollo 16 in an orbit 10.4 uh, nautical miles by 58.8. And at this time in mission control, we're in the midst of a shift handover. Uh, flight Director Gene Kranz and his team of flight controllers coming on to replace uh, the Pete Frank team. Uh, spacecraft communicator on the uh, upcoming shift will be astronaut uh, Donald Peterson. And we do plan to have a change of shift uh, briefing. Uh, we expect that that will start in uh, about 15 minutes. Uh, the briefing will be in the MSC News Center briefing room. At uh, 84 hours, 4 minutes, this is Apollo Control, Houston. This is Apollo Control Houston at uh, 84 hours, uh, 52 minutes into the mission. We're uh, a little more than 20 seconds away from scheduled time of acquisition of Apollo 16. Now on its uh, sixth revolution around the moon, we presently show uh, an orbit of uh, 58.8 nautical miles by uh, 10 
8.6 nautical miles. Meanwhile, in the uh, Mission Control Center, we have had a shift uh, changeover of flight control teams. The uh, white team of uh, flight controllers, uh, headed by uh, Flight Director Gene Krantz, is now aboard. A surgeon reports uh, that he has two of the crew members on uh, his uh, biomed. He uh, reported that uh, Lunar Module Pilot uh, Charlie Duke went to sleep uh, rather rapidly, whereas uh, Command Module Pilot uh, Ken Mattingly uh, was still awake at uh, loss of signal. The uh, crew of Apollo 16 is now in their rest period. Uh, however, we'll leave the line up on this uh, front side pass uh, in the event uh, we do have uh, conversation uh, with the crew of Apollo 16. Our CAPCOM uh, on this shift is uh, astronaut Don Peterson. We have acquired uh, data from Apollo 16 and we'll continue to monitor. Uh, this is Apollo Control Houston at 84 hours uh, 54 minutes uh, ground elapsed time. Apollo Control Houston at uh, 85 hours, uh, 19 minutes of ground elapsed time. Uh, we have some uh, 40 minutes uh, remaining on this uh, front side pass uh, for Apollo 16. Now on its uh, sixth revolution around the moon. Uh, we've had no uh, communication with the crew uh, presently in their rest period. Uh, however, we will continue to leave the line up uh, during uh, this front side pass. We show Apollo 16 uh, traveling, traveling at a velocity of uh, 5,546 uh, feet per second. A uh, current altitude 11 nautical miles. The uh, spacecraft is presently in an orbit of 58.8 uh, nautical miles by 10.5 nautical miles. Spacecraft uh, weight in orbit at this time uh, 76,109 pounds. At uh, 85 hours, uh, 20 minutes, uh, continuing to monitor, this is Apollo Control, Houston. <whistles> this is Apollo Control, Houston, at 85 hours, uh, 59 minutes, uh, ground elapsed time. Uh, at this time, we've... Uh, had loss of signal with uh, the Apollo 16 spacecraft as it passes above the backside of the moon. We will uh, take down our line at uh, this time and at uh, 85 hours uh, 59 minutes uh, this is Apollo Control Houston. This is Apollo Control Houston at 86 hours, uh, 46 minutes into the mission. Uh, we're coming up now on acquisition uh, with uh, Apollo 16, uh, now on its uh, seventh revolution around the moon. Apollo 16 is presently uh, in an orbit of uh, 58.9 nautical miles by 10.6 nautical miles. Uh, we expect uh, no conversation uh, with the crew on this uh, front side pass. Young uh, Duke Mattingly now well into their uh, rest period. Uh, we will uh, leave the line uh, down on this front side pass, uh, but we'll bring it up uh, should any conversation develop. We do now have acquisition uh, with Apollo 16 and are receiving data. At uh, 86 hours, uh, 47 minutes, uh, ground elapsed time, uh, this is Apollo Control, Houston. This is Apollo Control, Houston, at 87 hours, uh, 52 minutes, uh, ground elapsed time. Apollo 16 uh, has now uh, passed out of acquisition range. Uh, we had a loss of signal with Apollo 16 as it uh, passes above the uh, backside of the moon on the, its seventh revolution. We show uh, orbital parameters of 58.8 uh, nautical miles and uh, 
10.4 nautical miles. Uh, we had no uh, conversation with the crew of Apollo 16 during this frontside pass. The crew uh, is presently uh, in a rest period. We're at 87 hours, uh, 53 minutes, and uh, this is Apollo Control Houston. This is Apollo Control Houston at uh, 88 hours, uh, 40 minutes into the mission. Uh, we're standing by now uh, awaiting acquisition uh, with uh, the Apollo 16 spacecraft on its eighth revolution uh, around the moon. We presently show an orbit of uh, 58.9 nautical miles by 10.6 nautical miles. The uh, flight surgeon here in Mission Control uh, reports that uh, Command Module Pilot uh, Ken Mattingly and Lunar Module Pilot uh, Charles Duke uh, were sleeping very well when he looked at their data uh, through the last pass. We uh, are now receiving uh, data from Apollo 16. Uh, the spacecraft has been reacquired. We're at 88 hours, uh, 41 minutes into the mission, and this is Apollo Control Houston. This is Apollo Control Houston at 89 hours, uh, 46 minutes into the flight. We now show Apollo 16 uh, with uh, an orbit of uh, 58.8 nautical miles by 10.4 nautical miles. The uh, Apollo 16 spacecraft uh, has uh, passed out of range on its uh, eighth revolution around the moon. On this uh, past frontside pass, uh, we had no conversation uh, with the crew uh, still in their rest period. Our wake-up clock here in Mission Control shows that uh, the crew has one hour and 43 minutes of sleep time remaining before the wake-up call. We're at 89 hours, uh, 47 minutes, and this is Apollo Control, Houston. <laughs> 